Hey, hello everyone. This is criminal profiler, Pat Brown. And today I'm going to be doing the 40 year old case of Rhonda Hinson. Uh, this took place in Valdez, North Carolina. It's still quote unsolved. Uh, and usually I don't do cases that are this old, but I have reasons for this and I'm going to explain them to you. First of all, I would like to welcome everybody who's in the chat room. Uh, should I say, welcome back. Um, I'm, we're doing a reboot in case, um, well, if you're coming here, uh, I'm watching the, um, the, the video after it's up on uh, YouTube for the public, you won't know this. But if you are part of Patreon and are in the chat room, because we have a Patreon-only chat room, you will know that uh, we tried to do the show 15 minutes ago and it glitched all over the place. Um, don't know why. Um, I don't know if it's the internet. Uh, I, I decided to re reboot it. Uh, I left Google Chrome and on Microsoft, so who knows if that was it. Uh, but it's not because of my age. Everybody goes, oh, you know, you have problems with tech because of your age. I'm like, no, you know, sometimes tech problems have nothing to do with the user. It's everything to do with the platform. And I'm going to stick with that story. So anyway, I'm not going to say hello to everybody again because I just did. But everybody is back. Uh, looks like everybody's back and got their, their notice. So thank you for being patient. Uh, some of you went off and you got uh, popcorn, coffee, and one of you got tequila. And uh, <laughs> so now you're ready. And I, I don't see any glitching. Do you see any glitching? You know, you can see and hear me. Perfect. Okay. Oh, oh, come on now, Michaela. That's, that's so mean. <laughs> What's a pat video without tech issues? Yeah, sometimes, yeah, you just have to, you know, this is live. And it's totally different than when you're doing these, these really, really fancy videos you see, these really classy professional videos. Uh, you know how many hours they spend editing the crap out of those suckers? You know, they 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 work so hard on them and uh, they'll like put 10 hours into editing. And I have no patience for that nonsense. And besides, I like to be here with you guys. So mine are live and they come with their blemishes, you know, my face, the show. <laughs> It is what it is. Anyway, let me do my quick spiel before I get to the case, uh, just in case you would like to be in the chat room with these wonderful people. Yes, uh, you can join Patreon. Link is below. That supports the channel. This is an educational channel, as I keep saying over and over again. Uh, I do not just do gossip. I do not bleed a case. No, pun intended, maybe. Uh, with, with everything I can, anything thrown at the wall so that I can make money. Um, so I stick with crime scene analysis and profiling and people who really want to understand things. I'm not here to solve cases. You're not here to solve cases. You're here to learn. Um, and so therefore, that's why I have uh, uh, an educational channel and this, the Patreon only, oh, look, I have a glitch already. My, 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 <laughs> I saw my page was cut off, like really funny. Up there. Anyway, <laughs> that was a user problem. Okay, I admit. All right, so anyway, it's five bucks a month. There are at least eight lives, four show, four case shows, and four hangouts a month, and we're it's a really great community. So if you you don't have to do that though, you can just subscribe to the channel that also supports this educational channel, and that's free. Just subscribe, like, share in a crime crime group if you have one, and keep the channel going. Or you can buy one of my books below. Uh, this one's a, a mystery. I think you really love it. And there's also a little dollar sign you can click for a one time support of the channel. Okay, that's my spiel. <sighs> we must stay alive here, so we must do these things. Okay, so now to this case. All right. So everybody who hasn't been here before, wait. <laughs> I'm just looking at a few comments here, which I'm like, what? Okay, anyway. So 40-year-old case. And I actually um, didn't know this case. I'm going to explain why. But um, I was just doing my usual stuff, hanging around the internet. And uh, I ran into uh, something came up on my feed for YouTube. Uh, you know, sometimes you people will come and say, Oh, my gosh, I just got this on my feed for your channel. You know, I, I didn't know you had a channel, or I, I didn't know you did this case. And this is true for me as well. I see things pop up and I go, Oh, so anyway, this case popped up on uh, Ken Maine's channel Unsolved No More. And he had done this about 10 months ago at this point in time. Um, and this is a 40 year old case. And I'm like, interesting that he picked this case and so of course i i checked it out and uh I, it was fascinating um first of all i want to say that i thought he did a reasonably good job profiling the case um and and analyzing different details of it no complaints um but what was really funny was uh he was talking about it and he was saying how you know 
when you do these shows, you know, you're not working on the case. So you only have a limited amount of time you can put into research. And he said he put in a lot of research to this case, but still, you know, you got a, re a limited amount of time. So, and it depends what you happen to run into. And I looked at what he ran into and I'm like, fascinating. This is all seems to be new stuff that's come out fairly recently. And, and so then he said that he wished he could have gotten hold of the police reports and, and all of this. So I, I found this really interesting. So I put in a few uh, um, search uh, names into the search engine, including my own. And I came up with my name associated with this case, uh, my profile of the case in a, a, a fellow who had done, let me show you his name. Um, he had done, this is, I know, I know Ken, Ken Maynes did not see this one and I can't blame him. It, it was hard to find it. There were a couple of his thing, a couple of his articles here or there, here and there, but the bulk of his articles are actually on Facebook. And let me, let me find what I want to show you here. It's on a site called Remembering Rhonda Hinson. And he has on that site, he has this, these articles that he had written for the newspaper, The Killing of Rhonda Hinson. His name is Larry J. Griffin. And I want to give him credit right here uh, because I, I think a lot of journalists have lost their journalistic integrity and they don't do good work. This is not one of the guys. This guy did great work. And you can see he has, this is installment XCV. Okay, this is, I'm trying to remember my Roman numerals, 95. 95 installments, and they're long installments of this case on this site. I'm, the link is below. I went through all 95 of them, and my profile was in there. And you say, what profile? Well, here is, here is my... This is my case file of Rhonda Hinson. Uh, uh, and you can see this is, this is written like you can tell what people used to write years ago. <laughs> Indeed. And um, I had, this is, this is the letter uh, from the sheriff of, of Burke County to me, Pat Brown. And this is back in 2001. We're talking 20 years ago. And he said he's very interested in discussing the Ron Hinson case with me. Uh, hopes that I'll be able to help him. This my, my at the time, I, I my company was called the Sexual Homicide Exchange, although we didn't just do sexual homicides; we did all homicides. But anyway, he tells me he, he looks forward to uh, speaking to me in regard to this unsolved case. This is John McDivitt. All right, so um, and John McDivitt, and he worked. He also worked with this other fella um, at the at the time that I was in contact with him. Let me, let me find it here. Where's my guy? Okay, here we go. Uh, this is John McDivitt on the left. Uh, and this is a special agent, John Suttle from the FBI working in North Carolina. And so these are the two, these two guys I, con I was in contact with. And I eventually did, uh, they sent me in. Um, this is the, the entire, uh, this was the file they sent me. So you can see that there. And they sent me this file, okay? And it looks fairly thorough. And I want to talk about what Ken Main said. He says, I wish I could get to the police reports. Well, I did 20 years ago. But I will also point out that it's funny because in, 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 in the series that was written by Larry, he points out that I didn't know things. Because he wrote this He wrote this in 20, uh, the, the series came out in 2021. And he said, well, Pat might probably did not know this. And he was right. I didn't because they sent me this. I did not go to North Carolina. I wanted to. I wanted to go to North Carolina, sit in the office. This is the way I prefer. Go down to location and then sit there. They hand me literally everything. I get every I get every police report. I get uh, every interview. I get uh, all, the, all the forensics and so on and so forth. You usually spend like a week. So I uh, usually 10 to 12 hours a day because I'm you know, coming early and I leave late. So I can access everything. They sent me this. Well, it did have things in it that were useful, including I did have things like, you know, here we have the crime scene report. So I did have this. So I had a reasonable amount. And uh, apparently I, I did send it in. And, um, and after that, I didn't hear back. And this is not uncommon with cases. Once I have my report, I don't know why they wanted my report. Was it to get rid of the family from bugging them? Because, you know, hey, 
you know, it's, it's been 20 years and they're still harassing us, you know, um, was it because they thought I might have somebody different than they thought and might help? Maybe they just want me to back up what they said, but I sent it in. Then nothing further came of it. I was hoping to go to North Carolina. Never happened. Um, but the funny thing about this whole thing was after I read that I had had this, this profile, I could not find my profile. I looked everywhere. Um, I called, uh, called Judy Hinson, the mom. Uh, let me show you Judy Hinson, lovely lady. And, and she and her husband, Bobby, I mean, they, they they fought in every way possible to try to uh, get somebody to, to, to solve this case or to, to move it forward. So this is Judy at the time, Bobby at the time. And I talked to Judy, she's still on her same phone number. So that was kind of, kind of cool. I'm like, Hey, Judy, you're still there. And I said, how, how did how did the Larry get my my profile? I couldn't figure it out because I don't send profiles to journalists. I don't send profiles to families, but it was in this in his his stuff. So and I couldn't find mine. It was driving me insane. I didn't even remember talking to Larry, which really was weird. I'm like, I really talked to him. And the one article I found that wasn't before I found out about the Facebook articles actually said that he had called me and left a message and I hadn't called back. And I thought, well, maybe that's it. I never called him back but that didn't sound like me. And it wasn't until later that I found out that he had written in a later article that I had contacted him. We'd had a lovely conversation and I did call, call Larry and we just talked a couple of days ago. He sent me my entire profile. And thank you, Larry, because I couldn't find it. I had no idea what happened to it. It was bizarre. And, and we talked and he told me what I had said to him. And I'm like, yeah, that, that would be something I'd say. So um, I don't know why I don't remember it. He called me in March of 2020. My son had COVID at that time, had gone to the hospital. I don't know if I was highly distracted or I was just had talked to a number of journalists and he was just one of them. Never thought any more of it. I never saw the article. So when Ken Maine's uh, show came out, I'm like, huh. And then I found out all about uh, this article, 95, I mean, 95 installments uh, and very, very detailed, but he, he did such good journalism. He was able to get a lot of things that one couldn't get 20 years ago or 40 years ago. So, when you really want to delve into this case, you can go, um, the link is below for that. Uh, you can also see something really crappy, um, <laughs> really crappy. Oh my goodness. Um, this Unsolved Mysteries of Robert Stack, it's called, um, what was it called? Uh, unexplained Homicide or something. Oh, no, no, uh, Unexplained Death or something like that. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> she was shot. You know, we kind of know what happened. That's, she was murdered. What's your, what's your, and it's really short and it's really stupid. But, you know, if you want a little, um, the, the, the family is in it. Um, they have the facts wrong, unbelievably wrong. And um, But I guess it was a little bit of attention put on the case. Uh, Judy Hinson, never to give up. Um, after she contacted me, she contacted other people. She contacted the Vidoc Society, who supposedly also reviewed the case, and she never heard whatever happened with that. It's gone through some different people. And now uh, we can look at this. Cold case, cold case lingers after 40 years. Detectives running new data in a 1981 slang. So we have this new fellow. His name is Sheriff Steve uh, um, <laughs> Wissonant. Wissonant. Okay. I don't know who this guy is. He's the new sheriff in town. Um, he's like, hey, we're going to do something about this. We are. We're going to do something. Um but we've heard that for 40 years. So I, one of the things I want to do with this show is to show why things go the way they do in cases and why it's very hard to resurrect a cold case, especially in a case like this. Do I believe anything is going to come of this? Um, Sheriff saying, I'm going to solve it after 40 years. Unless DNA can prove something, probably not. I'll get to the DNA issue, not the end of the show. So anyway, here we go. What happened to Rhonda Henson? All right. All right. So let me go to Rhonda here. Okay. So Rhonda, Rhonda Henson. This is Rhonda over here. Um, as she had graduated high school, she was working. Um, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not going to go into lots and lots of little details of the case prior to the crime. Um, let's say she was a normal girl. Okay. And there's no Wikipedia page, <laughs> which shortens it. Okay. You know, I love Wikipedia in spite of itself because it's very concise, but there's none. So anyway, Rhonda, um, 
she was a normal girl. I graduated high school, was working and was working. She was a hardworking girl. Everybody liked her. She was friendly, da, da, da. And she was dating this guy named Greg. Now, Greg uh, also graduated. He was going to college. Um, they had been together about two years, all right? And this is Greg back then, with and without the mustache, I guess. This is Greg today. He's going to play heavily into this case because he's the boyfriend. All right. So let me just give you a very, very short scenario of what happened that night, okay? Very short. Um, uh, she left her friend's home. She went to a party for work. She left her friend's home. She dr was driving home. The car was found on the side of the road. She was shot. Dead. That's what they found. All right. That's the, that, that's the basics of it. Um, uh, the, the shot actually went through the, the room. See if I can find a picture here. Uh, yeah. Oh no, that's not quite. Yeah. Where's the, where's the one I wanted the picture? Oh, well, maybe it is that. All right. Oh yeah. You can see basically somebody shot, went through the trunk of the car and hit her in the chest. Okay. So that's not quite accurate, but there, there we go. That's sort of what happened. Um, and so, uh, the family was notified that there, should they thought she'd been an accident, but no, it was a murder. I mean, someone she'd been shot. Was it an accident? Was it kids playing with you know guns shooting off of the interstate? Because because it was an interstate uh, right there where she so you'd see the highway up here. Um, she would have been about here coming up, uh, and her house was this way, um, and yet she was and she was shot this direction. Uh, so people over here did hear the shots. So some, some in the beginning, they thought maybe they were standing up here shooting at the car. Um, some kids um, could have been just, you know, that kind of stupid teenage crap. There, there were some, a, a variety of theories, but basically she left her friend's house and on the ride home, she got shot. All right. So that's the basics. Now let me, let me just tell you about a few people in the story. Okay. So let's go back here. So a few people in the story are going to be uh, are going to be Rhonda, her boyfriend Greg. Okay, next over here we have Rhonda and her best friend. Okay, uh, and she's going to play a part in this too. Um, okay, so there's her here's her best friend and the her best friend and the best friend's boyfriend. Okay, so and uh, but her name is uh, Jill Turner and his name is this, this always is confusing to me. Jill Turner and he's Mark Turner. Okay. They're not brother, sister. <laughs> this is not incest here. Okay. Um, I think I just happen to have the same last name. It's kind of weird, but true. They, they were just dating. They weren't married. She ended up marrying somebody else. Okay. But Mark Turner plays an important role here um, in trying to figure out what the heck happened. Okay. So those are some of the basics. And let me show you one more person who's going to play into this. And that is Rhonda's boyfriend, Greg. This is his father, Reverend Charles McDowell. Okay. So Greg lived with a sibling and his mom and dad, the Reverend Charles McDowell and his, his mom. Okay. So those are kind of the basic players. If you don't go for, she was shot just driving home. Some kids shot her on the way home. All right. And that, and that's really important to understand that it's one or the other. Now, let me, let me go to, uh, I'm going to use my, a bit of my profile here. Um, just to get, get you the background of this. Um, hold on a second. Let me find my profile that, that my friend Larry found for me. <laughs> thank you, Larry, so much. Uh, really, thank you. All right. So um, where's my pro? Oh, come on. What the heck? What's going on here? What? Hold on one second. Hey, you know those tech problems? <laughs> what the heck? I'm going to read you my profile because it just, I swear, I thought I downloaded that one. But apparently, <laughs> all right, that tech problem is mine. It really is. Okay, let me, let me, let me go find where I'm at here. All right, so uh, we'll find my profile because uh, I had to download it myself because I don't have an actual physical copy of it. So it's now missing in action. What in the heck? 
Hold on one second. Oh, here we go. No, we don't. Oh, what world is that? Um, <laughs> after, I, after I defended myself on the tech issues, now, now I'm humiliating myself here. What in the heck is... Oh, here, here we go. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you know, when you put these shows together, like I, I said, explain. Sometimes you don't have as much time as you'd like because you're not working on the case for, for months and all that stuff. You're, you're trying to get a show done for the weekend, and this is one of these. All right, so let me read to you basically what happened, okay? On December 23rd, 1981, I'm sorry, at, at approximately 1 a.m., it was actually like 12.50. But mind you, I'm, I, I was going with information that they sent me way back when. R Ronda Hinson was shot and killed while driving her vehicle en route from a friend's house to home. The weapon was never recovered, and while there were numerous suspects, no arrest was ever made. The family contacted me to see if we could determine the killer from the list of suspects and to suggest any action the police investigation might take at this at a later date, when they and it, because there's no physical evidence now to go to trial with. Okay, and there we have the biggest issue in this whole case. Uh, she was shot. They got the bullet, but they never got the weapon. And they never, as far as I could see, they never tested anybody for GSR, gunshot residue, which I found phenomenal. Now, they had suspects. So, I mean, some of those suspects could have showered and so on and so forth, but they also had a vehicle. The vehicle had a trunk in it, maybe. They could have tested the trunk of the vehicles. They could have, anything they could have done to see if there was gunshot residue someplace associated with a, with a, a suspect. That I do not find any evidence of that in my report, in the police reports. And when I was looking at Larry's work and the 95 things, I put in I put in a search for gunshot residue and I came up with zero. Biggest mistake of this case. Somebody shot with a gun. <laughs> what do you look for? Look for the gun. First thing you do, find the gun. If you don't have the gun, you don't have the weapon that commit that the person used to commit the crime. So you have whatever suspects you've got, go look for the gun. Now, it's true. Sometimes you need a court order, a search, a search warrant and all that. But I can't find anything. Now, again, my records may be what they sent me, but I don't see that they were searching for the gun. I think they're hoping it would just pop up. And this gun thing will be very important in this whole case, obviously, because it is the weapon that was killed, used to kill her. And if they had looked for gunshot residue, that, you know, that might have helped. But I don't see it any place. Um, the suspect list includes a young group of party goers, uh, some of who had stopped and discovered the car. So there were these, these young men and they called the police. Um, and also some guy had asked Ron out for a date and she refused. OK, another suspect was Rhonda's boyfriend, Greg McDowell. That's Greg. And the boyfriend's father, Reverend McDowell. Um, Reverend McDowell, Greg's father, is one, kind of a, well, shall we say a creepy character? <laughs> he was a little handsy. It appears he might have been handsy with Rhonda, you know, and he, he, he was supposed to be a pastor, but he was like <clears throat> uh, a little bit immoral for being a pastor and I uh, ended up divorced from his wife due to that and lost his church because of his philandering um, and uh, creepy sexual stuff. So daddy, yeah, D daddy had some issues um, and he, and he actually was a strong suspect for, for Rhonda's mom. And I'm going to explain why he became a strong suspect for her. She, you know, I've talked with her and she still believes he could have done it. Um, he's very elderly now very elderly, and it's her biggest fear, we just talked on the phone about this, that even if she does think he did it, that the police might say after he dies, that he, not that he confessed, but that evidence leans toward his involvement, therefore we're closing the case. Now, before you say, oh, they wouldn't do that without actual proof, yeah, that, that happens quite a lot, and I, that bothers the heck out of me. I mean, sometimes cases are closed administratively due to the fact your suspect is dead. You're never going to go to court. And you do believe he did it. But in my opinion, if you're going to tell the public that, if you're going to tell the family that, you should at least tell them what evidence supports you closing the case down, that nobody else could have done it but this particular person. So I say this to Judy, Judy Hinson, 
I hope you're not right. Uh, because first of all, I don't think he did it, but also I, if they do think he did it, they, I don't want them to close the case down just because they think so. And also don't want them to close the case down when they don't think so, but it would be expedient. Um, and just to do that and not provide any evidence and just finally say, look, we, we've done, we've done our job. Um, and we can, can't do anymore. I'm concerned about that. But anyway, that that's daddy. All right. So there are other assorted suspects, none of which sign the significant, the evidence puts a focus on them. Motives for the suspects would include for the party goers, none. Only an act of foolishness would seem to be the reason for any of this group to shoot Rhonda in her vehicle, basically just for fun. The man who asked Rhonda out may well have been angry at her refusal, but it usually doesn't add up to murdering her because she just said no on one, no for one date. Besides, what she was dating somebody else, so really, that would that would be that <laughs> that would be a little like, excessive. Not that it couldn't happen. Uh, one thing uh, Ken Mays does say, which I which I entirely agree with, is the concept of what's possible and what's probable. It's possible that this teenager shot shot her. It's not probable due to the evidence. Uh, one guy who she turned down, was it possible? Yes, but it's not probable due to the evidence. When we're looking at evidence. The point about crime scene analysis and profiling is to focus specifically on evidence. That's what deductive profiling is. Um, even though it's true, inductive, inductive profiling uses a lot of statistics. Statistically, the most likely person to have killed Rhonda would be her boyfriend because they broke up that night. Statistically, that's accurate. However, I will not do a case based on statistics alone. I mean, you may have that in the back of your head, but if you use that as the reason, which unfortunately some profiling does and bothers me tremendously, that's, inc that's not how you do it. You, you can know that information, but you have to have evidence from the scene that would then point to the boyfriend, not just the general statistics. All right. So um, now let's go to the boyfriend. Rhonda's, uh, Rhonda's boyfriend was angry with her for attending a party that she, he had requested she not attend. It was a company party. He did not want her to go. Now they've been together for two years, but he, some, uh, some of the uh, interviews with people said he was obsessed with her, uh, stalkerish, controlling, and their relationship was going downhill. And the most dangerous time, this statistically is true, is when you break up with a boyfriend who wants you to not break up with him. Um, so, yes, um, he didn't want to go to this party and she went anyway. It seemed that they had reached a point of breaking up. Now, one thing I want to mention here, because this to me is, is one of the, the pieces of information that I think is outstanding in this particular case, as far as history goes and victimology. Um, I've always said that nobody commits a crime that they haven't already imagined in their head. In other words, we don't do things we can't imagine doing. Somebody said to me, I'm trying to think of something weird. <laughs> so Pat, uh, I think you jumped out of an airplane uh, with a parachute specifically to come do something. I'm like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> There's no, never in my imagination have I imagined myself jumping out of an airplane. I'm terrified of ice. <laughs> I have no desire to do so. I'll do so with virtual reality glasses. Sure. You know, hey, I'm jumping out of the airplane. I will never do that in real life. In my wildest imagination, that's not one of my scenarios. You don't imagine doing something that you aren't actually thinking about. Uh, in my classes, my favorite line is if you, if you came home and you found your significant other in, in your own bed with somebody else, what would you do? And it's fascinating to hear the responses. Uh, the responses can be anything from screaming and yelling to walking out, to throwing things, to punching, to chucking things out the window, uh, and then deciding who you're going to punch, the significant other or the person who the significant other is with or both of them, or if you're going to go get a knife or if you're going to go get a gun and kill them. I, and I ask this question, and I usually get this stunned look because people don't want to answer this question. But I can answer it myself without a problem. I mean, I know me. I know what I have envisioned 
as who I am. I happen to own a nine millimeter. Never, ever in my imagination would I think of taking my, going to my safe, taking the nine millimeter out and shooting anybody. I don't think of getting a knife and stabbing people. Throwing things is not beyond me. <laughs> Punching is not beyond me because I've done martial arts. But I wouldn't punch the person who was in bed with my significant other. I'd punch that sucker out. That would be in my mind. Throwing things out the window. Not really me. Um, no, I'm not into throwing, throwing things out windows. Throwing things in the room, yes. Dishes. <laughs> they make good sounds. And, and of course, I would pick carefully. No, not that one. This one. I don't like that. That one. That one's one of my favorite. This piece of crap I got from Target. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yes, I can imagine. Never in my mind would I think of a gun. Now, let me show you something very interesting. I'm going to go to some of your comments after this. All right. This is the relationship Greg had toward, during his relationship with Rhonda. They had a happy, they had happy times, but then they have this. That she called herself Fuzzy Lassie for some reason. Now, there's a little romantic crap people, right? Not me, but other people. Um, but the summer of 1981 correspondence that passed between the young couple suggests that their relationship was devolving from amorous into abusive, both physically and emotionally. The evidence of which was referenced in a rare, terse, handwritten response penned by Rhonda Henson. In it, she breaks her shielded silence to protest Greg's treatment of her. Since I am such a liar, I ain't saying nothing. Thank you for hurting my lip and jaw where my tooth, where my tooth hurts. No longer your fuzzy lassie. Uh, the claim is that he like backhanded her. And I'm already concerned because already, not only does he have ideation of harm, he actually has enacted it. Now look at this. You better be happy and smile and be your usual self tonight or I'll shoot you with my shotgun. This was one month before she was shot. Who the hell, sorry, who the hell says you better be happy or I'll shoot you with my shotgun. Say what? Is Well, that's romantic as heck. <laughs> the fact is not that he would have shot her with a shotgun if she hadn't smiled. But the fact that he had the ideation of if you don't, if you're not happy and you don't make me happy, I could kill you. That is bizarre ideation and very concerning ideation. That's that's where you should have been out of that relationship a year ago uh, and hopefully and got protection. All right. Next one. I just finished my trig exam and I was thinking about you. I love you. Please don't let those exams get you down. OK, you better be happy or I'll get you. Remember, I have a shotgun. Ha, huh, just kidding. Again, he refers to shooting her. Twice. That's concerning ideation. Ideation always comes before action. There's nothing you do that you don't think about before you do it. I don't care what people say. I don't care if it's five seconds before you did it. You thought about it. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. The, 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 the picture went through your head. And then you done did it, you know? So this is highly concerning to me. And this is going to play into motive and also uh, whether this crime, because I disagree with Ken Maines on this, and, and a lot of people do agree with Ken Maines, so he's not alone in this, whether this was, if he, if he committed the crime, whether this was um, an accident or shall we say just, just carelessness, a manslaughter thing, he wasn't actually trying to kill her or whether it really was 100% premeditated murder. And I'll go into that in a minute. But let, oh, we've got 139 comments. <laughs> I may not get to all of those, but I'm going to stop here and I'm going to go into the last night and what exactly happened and some of the interesting things with that. But this, basically at this point, when I looked at this case, I said, okay, let me finish what I said. Uh, the father of this boyfriend is suspected of making sexual overtures at at Rhonda and is possibly sexually abusing her. She had some weird things where she was saying she, she took showers in the middle of the night saying she felt dirty. Uh, 
And Rain says, well, but she just did feel dirty. It wasn't anything to do with sexual abuse. But I find that kind of weird. Usually that's odd for a teenage girl to suddenly have to shower in the middle of the night. That's that's something off. So maybe she did feel creepy. Uh, she didn't want to be around his, his father at all. She said that he put his hand on her leg. One time he, she came out of a, sh uh, a bathroom and he was like there. I don't know whether her descriptions are accurate or whether they're over they're overreach as far as that. But considering that the pastor has kind of like a, not the most moral behavior, <clears throat> I wouldn't put it past him. Let me put it that way. However, so so it seems that uh, so he was a possible suspect, the father, like, like, you know, hey, if she was, you know, he she he was messing with her. Maybe he wanted to eliminate her from the picture so she wouldn't rat him out. Um, so it came down to really to the, the, the son and his daddy, um, the pastor. All right. So. Um, I, point, I read, wrote this. The father of this boyfriend is suspect, suspected of making sexual overtures at Rhonda and possibly sexually abusing her. He has since had an affair while married, divorced his wife, and subscribed to pornographic materials in spite of being a church pastor. Lost his position in the church. Um, so uh, I paid it, uh, this is stuff I paid attention to. But I will explain later why I did not think the father committed the crime. But let me go to your, your questions here. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, that's interesting. Powell vibes. Susan Powell. Good, good point on that one. Um, uh, showering like that is definitely a sign of sexual abuse. I think so too. I just don't know how serious it might have been. Um, hold on a second. <coughs> Sorry. My, my little granddaughter came over and hacked in my face. It's not COVID. She still gave me a cold. I mean, you know, those things used to exist before COVID and that's what I've got. I did check. I don't have COVID. I'm just hacky and sneezy. Mm, excuse me. Children are dangerous to be around. Um, um, so, um, oh, um, Okay, I, I noticed some talk about here about Ken Maines because um, I did speak up again. I did not, I have issues with his bringing a, a killer on to be a profiler. I think that's outrageous and I think the killer is a psychopathic liar. But, and I spoke very strongly against this. I think it's unethical. However, as far as Ken Maines' ability to, to, to describe how he would look at crimes, that remains the same. Um, so sometimes, you know, I don't approve of things that happen. I'll speak strongly against them, but it doesn't mean that everything they do sucks. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, uh, this is interesting. Kelly says, I don't think he was really just kidding. Um, yeah. And, uh, M Michaela says, what was she shot with? I'm assuming a rifle. It was supposedly a high powered rifle that was never found. Um, and there's a lot of argument over what the what the what the um, weapon would be, and I'm not going to go there because a I, I, I'm, I, that's not my field. Uh, B they never found the weapon, so I got nothing to compare it to. Uh, but a lot of people in that area might have a rifle for hunting that is similar to that. Uh, could have even had a scope on it. Um, could Greg have that? Clearly, he talks about his shotgun, which he did own. His daddy was a hunter. They did have weapons. Um, the claim was that he was a wimp and that he wasn't he wasn't into weapons, which might be true, but he kept mentioning them, which is concerning. <laughs> His boyfriend is a creep, says Sandra. Um, you know, relationships are complicated, shall we say. You know, you're in high school, you meet somebody. He's a cute dude. I mean, he's cute. Um, who knows how much fun he was until a point. But a lot of times you can't read what's really underneath a lot of stuff, especially when you're in the teenage years. How many people have said those teenage, oh, my God, he was, I, was, I was his friend in high school. He was so great. And then he becomes a mass murderer, you know, because 
until you get full power, until you leave your parents' nest, a lot of times you don't do a lot of things that you would do if you were, you know, if you weren't imprisoned by your family. Um, but even teenagers sometimes will kill their families, or they will do things when they're still in their homes. But a lot of times, when you, when you meet up in a high school situation, um, I don't know. I never had a high school boyfriend, so there you go. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> I was socially retarded. Anyway, you know, um, but I know girls who went to dances and crap, you know, they did. They had lovely high school lives and she, she went to a prom. She went to a prom with him. Yeah. I wrote a poem. It's called, um, um, what is it called? Um, uh, let's see. It was called high school years. High school. Year, oh, oh man. I forgot my poem. <laughs> um, but let me put it this way I didn't go to the prom hmm. yeah high school year is I don't care never remember being there high school high, uh, high school prom oh shoot I forgot my whole little I have a little cute little poem anyway darn it all days. high school years what I don't remember being oh man I forgot my poem Oh, well, I'll have to look it up sometime and put it out there somewhere. It's a cute poem. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I wasn't popular in high school. I didn't go to the prom. I didn't go to any of the dances. I didn't have any dates. <laughs> she did. She met this cute guy and they hung out together and had a good time and, and went to the prom and, and had two years of relationship. And I'm sure a lot of that relationship was nice. I mean, they were sharing letters together and he gave her presents. And this is going to be important. He gave her presents. Um, she gave him presents, and this has a lot to do with what they found in the car and why he became reasonably a suspect in this particular case. Okay, um, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I didn't date either, Pat, for my prom. My whole limo was filled with dateless girls. <laughs> Oh, that, that's terrible. Now, now you just, now wait a minute. I, I know that this is supposed to be a, you know, everybody says, you know, you know, Pat, you're talking about something really serious here. So, you know, you, and I, this is a case I worked, I have tremendous um, concern for the family. Um, but, you know, I always do sometimes put in some, uh, some, some levity, shall we say, keywords. Uh, let's see. I'm going to see if I can find my poem because I actually put this poem on the internet one day. Let's see if I, I can see if I can find it. Um, what's it? It's a great poem. Let's see. Yeah, bloody heck. I'm not going to find it. Oh, high school union. That's how it started. I was wondering how it started. High school union. I don't care. Hardly remember being there. Missed the prom. Had no dates. No ex love to cast a gate. Yearbook pages, specious land. Never touched by. You no, know, yearbook pages, empty land, never touched by specious hand, high school reunion, I don't care, hardly remember being there, something like that. I can't find my real poem. But, you know, some of us didn't do well. <laughs> but, you know, this is the whole thing. When you're young and you're, you know, you're in high school and you, you meet the guy and he's exciting, you know, and he, and he says he's not a bad looking dude. So, you know, it's like, you know, he's cute and cuddly and, you know, everything's cool. You, you know, you're dating. I get it. You know, well, maybe I didn't get it. <laughs> I didn't get anything. But anyway, I get why she and Greg had this relationship. But unfortunately, we don't recognize sometimes as a teenager uh, what we're dealing with. And she, you know, over time, the relationship was going downhill and she was having issues with him. But how bad were they? You know, which, what would she recognize? The fact that he was saying, hey, I'll shoot you with my gun. She's probably just tossed off as just silly talk, which is what people do. They take things that are concerning, but they don't know they're concerning because, you know, you're a teenager. Um, even the, even adults might not recognize that that is concerning ideation. They would just say, he's just, he just, he just, he just throwing stuff out there to, to make, you know, Ooh, I'm going to scare you, you know, ha, ha, ha. It's really not funny, but they don't get it's not funny. And that he's really thinking this kind of thing. That he will not take a breakup very well. That she is his and 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 she can't go someplace. She can't walk away from him. 
Um, she can't not do be the be, she cannot not be the woman he wants or the girl he wants. She must be happy. She must please him. She must be with him. Uh, this is this is what he's saying, and he has many letters that sort of you know, promote this whole kind of concept. Um, I want to see what uh, Maria states. Like paranoid people being stalked. The hardest case is to solve. A creepy, violent dude can lose their ex-girlfriend to murder without him murdering her. Statistics are not always right. Well, that can be true, too. But, I mean, so, yes, I, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to say, but could he not have done it? Yes, he could be saying things and something else could happen to her. That is very true. So uh, the police have to do due diligence. They have to make sure they check out everything. The problem I think happened in this case, which is what makes, which is what I really want to say about this whole case. Why is it 40 years on not solved? Because I believe they look too many other directions when they should have been looking here. Um, and I'm going to explain exactly why they should have been looking here, because the more time you waste, the more time there is to get rid of a weapon, the more time there is to get rid of G GSR, the more time there is just generally speaking wasted until the point where you can't solve the crime because now you have no evidence. So that is to me very important. And I think they wasted a, way too much time on various other people when there was a lot of evidence If they in the first 48 had interviewed the right people right away and gone forth with it. They might have been more successful. Um, so, let me go further on, on what I had to say on this profile and also show you what actually happened that night. All right. Now, let me let me go to what happened that night. All right. I'm going to read you some, some reports from that night. All right. So this starts with um, Rhonda at home. Ice had formed on Burke County roads overnight, making morning commutes treacherous on the morning of December 22nd. Rhonda decided not to drive her Dotson to work in Hickory. Instead, she made arrangements to drive with a coworker, and she went out to wait for him, and he took her in. I'm not, that's the, so on and so forth. Okay. Oh, Judy Hinson says in the second paragraph, I just told her to stay home. Even though she worked part-time since she was 14 years old, she was always looking for an excuse to stay home from work. That is, until she went to work at Hickory Steel. Since employed, Rhonda had not missed a day's work at her three-month-old job, and that Tuesday would not be an exception. Uh, I want to point this out. She was just very, very, um, she was really, you know, being adult. She was doing her job. She didn't want to, you know, skip, skip out. She wanted to be considered a valued employee. Well, she started out the door to meet her ride with little more than a sweater on. I said, Rhonda, you've got to wear a coat. It's too cold to just wear what you have on. You know how many times mothers say that and grandmothers say that? I always tell my granddaughter, hey, you can't, you know, it's it's 32 degrees out there going down. You can't just wear a simple thin sweater. What if the car breaks down? Think about when the car breaks down. Not so much that you can't keep the heat on when you're in the car, but the car breaks down and you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're going to freeze to death. I am not because I look how well I'm dressed. We, ne we never stop. Okay. Um, I said, Rhonda, you've got to wear a coat. It's too cold to just wear what you have on. She said that she didn't have a coat to wear. She told me that Greg had her East Burke letter jacket and she had left her gray hooded sweat jacket in Mark Turner's car when they went shopping to buy Jill a Christmas gift. These two items become very important. First of all, although they're, they're, I, I still don't quite understand if it's a freezing cold day, why we, why you would consider um, a, these pieces, these pieces of clothing, particularly toasty, you know, um, I, I still think that that's not enough, but then that's just me. I think that's hardly anything that's going to keep you warm, but let me, let me find uh, the pictures. Oh, where'd they go? Hold on. There they are. All right. This was the gray sweatshirt. She, ha she wore that. She had that with her when she went shopping with her, with her best friend, boyfriend. She went to get a, he asked her to go to the mall and help her him pick out a gift for Jill, her best friend. Perfectly reasonable. And she had that with her and apparently left it in his vehicle. Okay, this is important. This is a this is a jacket that um, I guess was that was the one that was Greg's Greg's stuff, you know. 
the reason these two are important is they both ended up in this vehicle right here right here white this white thing is actually this gray sweatshirt and this blue jacket was in the back seat on this side of the car she said as you notice what she said was greg had her east burkett letter east burke letter jacket and she had left her gray hooded sweatshirt and mark turner's car when they went to shop to buy Jill a Christmas gift. She did not have either one of those on the 22nd in her own vehicle. They were not in the vehicle. This is where uh, things get so weird. Okay. This is where things go really crazy. All right. So that's that. She, so she, this was during the day. Okay. Let's find out what else happened during that day. Meanwhile, Greg McDowell drove to Hickory Steel at lunchtime to take Rhonda to lunch. She exited the building accompanied by Tony, Tonya, who a coworker, and one of uh, somebody else who she would go to later go to the Christmas party with. Tonya looked across the parking lot and noticed Greg waiting for his girlfriend in a blue Chevy Nova. Remember the words blue Chevy Nova. She also observed that the front of the car had apparently sustained damage at some juncture. All right. So this was a family car, this blue Chevy Nova that had had problems in the, with the front of the car that that car was later identified by witnesses at the, who came by the scene. That's why this is so important. All right. Let's, so, so now we have this day. She doesn't have the two jackets. Greg goes by her work, uh, driving a, the, the car that is later seen at the scene. Now let's keep go further. Okay. Having not been invited to the party by his girlfriend, she didn't want him to go. He didn't want her to go, but she didn't want him to go. Greg, stay, Greg McDowell stayed at home that evening, according to his parents, who also descended not to attend the Hickory Steel Christmas celebration. It is unclear of the reason. She, the mom said she had a stomach virus, but yeah, that was something weird. And then it was also claimed that the father, had some, the daughter, that's his sister, um, Greg's sister, stayed at her father had somebody to take care of that night of the party, and that's why they didn't attend. We don't know. We'll never know. So Greg, the parents could have attended. They didn't. Uh, Greg did not want Rhonda to go. It's like, well, I don't want you to go there. You're going to hang around other guys. No. She, she, she was like, yeah, well, whatever. You're too jealous. Stay home. She didn't want him to go and ruin her night, essentially. So you see things aren't going well. No, things are not going well. Okay, let's go on. So now she's gone to the party. Now here's, this is the whole story as the party ends. Bobby and Judy Hinson were not expecting their daughter to come home after the party because she said she was going to spend the night with Sherry Pittman. All right, that's her. That's another friend of hers. Uh, she recounted, uh, Ron had to go to work the next day, so she said it would be easier to go from Sherry's house, which was closer to, I guess, the location she was working at. Before she departed for the party, Rhonda Henson laid out a change of clothes to take with her, clothes that never made it to her car. That's kind of weird. I never got an explanation on that. She left them on her bed. It would have bothered her to. It wouldn't have bothered her to wear the ne to, to go to work the next morning with the new clothes she had worn to the party. It was to be her last day of work before the Christmas holidays. Well, usually you. I'm sorry. Usually girls don't want to show up in what they wore at the party. It's like, man, did you? Usually that means you slept with somebody. <laughs> That's why you're still in the same clothes. Usually it's not a good thing. So I don't know why she didn't take her clothes with her. She was planning to stay there. I find that statement really strange. But I've never gotten a clear answer on that. Nothing makes sense to me on that. There are things that happen in a case. This is, I haven't worked this case in 20 years. And I only got what I got from the, the police department. I got some from the family. But I just don't understand that particular statement. Um, that she was planning to stay there. Why the heck would she not have taken some clothes? Um, would she... Uh, Obviously, if she had the same clothes on, you know, she slept overnight, a friend would have given her something to sleep in and she got up in the morning to throw some clothes on. But I don't know what she wore to the party was appropriate for the office. So I don't know any of this stuff, but it seems a little odd to me. Let's say that. All right. By the time Rhonda arrived at the Pittman house, the Hickory Steel party had likely begun. It is decided that Sherry would drive and that Tonya, who lived nearby, would, along with Rhonda, would leave their automobiles at the Pittmans. So she didn't, she didn't drive to the party. Even though she told her mom that she would leave the festivities if Grace McD Greg McDowell and his fam parents made an appearance, it certainly was not lost on her that she would have to remain at the party until Sherry decided to drive them back to the house to retrieve the vehicles. 
Fortunately for Rhonda, the McDowell's never showed. Again, we had this weird thing where she, like, is for whatever reasons, avoiding the hell out of Greg and his family and his parents, wouldn't want to be there with them, and yet she has no way to get out of there. So we got a lot. Of, I don't know if it's a confused teenager or there's something, something just is, we're not being told. All right. Now, meanwhile, anyway, meanwhile, back in Valdez, Jill Turner Mole. Now, Jill is her best friend awaited the arrival of her boyfriend, Mark Turner. The couple were going to drive back to his house to spend the evening. Dinner and a movie were on the agenda. However, Jill had to return home by midnight. I was only 18 years old, home from college, and still living with my parents. I had no car, but I still had a curfew. 12 o'clock midnight. Ms. Turner Mall explained that during an initial, uh, tw uh, the interview uh, was like a way, 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 way later. Uh, after we ate, we sat down to watch a movie and fell asleep. Okay, this is important because Mark Turner had this they had the jacket, supposedly, and it ended up in her car on that night. So a lot depends on Jill. Jill has Jill is, is Rhonda's best friend. I don't know that she has reason to lie, but I don't know how well if she's remembering things properly or she I don't know. But she says that she should have been home at twelve, but they fell asleep, and she the 12 o'clock hour passed, which gives him, makes it a little bit later for him. So let's go on. All right. Also, okay, so now we're talking about Ms. Pittman. Let's go back to, the, so Jill's over there with her boyfriend. 12 o'clock has passed, they've fallen asleep. Jill's in a different location. I'm going to explain why it's important because of this, this jacket up here that you're looking at over here, this one. But meanwhile, Rhonda's over at the Pittman's house after the party. Uh, all right, so the mom, Mrs. Pitt, Ms. Pittman, or Mrs. Pittman, uh, she was Mrs. Pittman at that time. This was 1980s. We didn't use Ms. Okay. She maintained that her husband had gone to bed around 11 p.m. She normally stayed up later and did so that evening. Ms. Pittman stated that she busied herself ironing her husband's white shirts. <laughs> oh, I'm going to say she, if she ironed his white shirt, she was Mrs. Pittman. <laughs> Sorry. Couldn't help myself. All right. A task that took 30 minutes or more to complete. Mr. Pittman, you had a great wife because, man, you know, I, I was married to a Jamaican for 25 years and the most horrifying thing happened after we divorced. None of my clothes were ironed properly because I never was a good ironer. I was like, I'm done. And then my husband would go, you're going to wear this now. And he would iron every little nook and cranny. Jamaican men are good at ironing. Ah, I miss that. I do. Now I just have to let them try to dry in the dryer and the dryer and go. I hope it's okay. <laughs> so, Mrs. Pittman, nah, that's a lot of hard work. Mr. Pittman, you're a lucky man. All right, anyway, I digress. All right, so she was in the process of folding the ironing board and storing it when Rhonda, Tonya, and her daughter returned. It was 11.50 p.m. Okay, so now we're at 11.50 p.m. So Jill is over with her boyfriend, okay, Mark, with a jacket, supposedly, um, in his car. And it's now over 12 o'clock. And now 11.50, the girls return home from the party at a different location. All right. Let me go forward. All right. So at a certain point, uh, 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 well, let me let me go, go down here. This is more of this full statement. So Ron and Sherry go upstairs and are chatting away. Around midnight, about 10 minutes later, Rhonda Henson asked Mrs. Pittman if she could use the phone to call Greg, explaining it would not be long distance to call from there. She walked down the steps and called Greg from a wall phone near the downstairs kitchen. I did not hear the conversation, but remember Rhonda saying that her boyfriend was very mad. Uh, and she said, I'm leaving to go home now. When she hung up the phone, she went to the bathroom. When she came out, she was crying. My mother asked if Greg was mad, and she said, good God, yes, he's mad. Good God, yes, he's mad. Like that. Good God, yes, he's mad. She didn't want him to go to the party. He didn't want to go to the party. She didn't want him to go to the party. They're having a conversation at midnight, and it's not nice. She's crying. Uh, things are bad anyway. Now he's mad as hell, and she's paranoid of him because she's worried about him being mad. But he's mad. He's really mad. Now what happens now? All right. At that juncture, even though she had planned to stay overnight, although she didn't take any of her clothes, Rhonda left abruptly after saying, I had better go. The two ladies stood at the downstairs and watched Rhonda get into her car and leave between 12.15 and 12.20. 
this is important. Look at the timing, 1220. It would take her about 18 minutes to make the drive from Sherry's house to Mineral Springs Road exit off of Interstate 40. It would take, let's see, what it says, 18 minutes. So we're talking about she should arrive about 1235, 1240. She had approximately 35 minutes to live. So she would arrive 1235, 1240. Let me try to show you a picture. I've got a bunch of pictures. Um, I, I had to figure out where everybody lived because they, they weren't. that wasn't clear. I never got a crime scene report that showed an actual map and that this person lived here, this person lived here, this is how it all worked. It was very confusing. And this is important because all of the timing stuff makes a difference. So she was coming from... Excuse me why I throw up a whole bunch of crap that is not accurate on the screen until I find it. All right. Uh, I found it. Okay. <laughs> okay. I got lucky. All right. Fourth Avenue Northwest. That is where the Pittmans lived. Uh, I don't know what was there uh, 40 years ago. This is the roots now. She was on, the, I think, whatever quick route it was. Um, so you see this, I think it's a 17-minute route. I'm not sure. But anyway... When she gets down to that location, it says Mineral Springs Mountain Road. That's where she exited the highway. All right. So it would take her that long to get there. Now, let's go on to see what was said. Um, hold on a second. Let me figure out where it was at. Uh, okay. Okay. About four miles west of the Pittman's residence, Jill Turner. Now, Jill Turner is now, she supposedly fell asleep during the movie several minutes before midnight. I don't remember what the movie was we're watching. It must not, must not have been riveting because we both fell asleep. I woke Mark up and told him we had to go. My parents weren't, weren't going to be happy about me missing the curfew. So they got in his car, made a 15 to 18 minute drive from the Turner home to Jill's house. Okay, now four miles west of, hold on a second, let me figure this out. So he went to her house. Now let me see I've, I've got a picture of where house went. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, that's not what I want. All right. Mm -mm. Okay, here's Mark. Okay, so now she's in Mark's car. She goes to kiss him goodnight, and she got to her house. And I glanced into Mark's backseat and noticed Rhonda's hooded sweatshirt with the HHWTC lettering on it. Okay, that's this. She looks on that very night. They're driving after midnight. They're driving to her home. As she gets there, she says, hey, that's 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 her that's her stuff in the back. Uh, you know, and he says, yeah, that's we went when we went to buy you the present. She left it in the car. I told him he could give it to me and I would make certain Rhonda got it back. He replied he would just give it to Greg when he saw him next. OK, now there's a lot of arguments over this. It's like, what the hell? You know, why not? It's your. That's her best friend. Why don't you just give her the stupid jacket and let her take care of it? Why do you have to wait to give it to Greg? Now, I find that bizarre myself um, because usually a guy will be happy to get rid of crap that women are dealing with. You know, it's like, yeah, give it to your friend. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to deal with it anymore. Hey, cool. Why do you want to have to give it to Greg? I do not know. It could just be that. He was planning to see Greg sooner, and he just thought, oh, I'll just give it to Greg. I, I don't know. And here's where we have to st be careful that we don't start imagining crap. But the important thing is she claims, Jill claims, Rhonda's best friend, that that was in his car on the night that she was dropped off right prior to the murder of Rhonda Henson. And this becomes one of the biggest mysteries of the whole thing. Okay, so let's go forward. All right. Mark left the Turner Valdez residence, traveled down sloping Hazel Street. Okay. And paused at the stop sign prior to making a left-hand turn onto Mineral Springs Mountain Road toward the interstate. <coughs> it's approximately 1230 a.m. All right. I had to do a lot of mapping here. All right. Let me see if I can find it. I got a lot of maps. So excuse me while I run around here with the damn maps. All right. Where's Hazel Street? Not that there. Not there. Not there. Where's Hazel? Hazel, where are you? Hazel. 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 Damn it. Hazel. <laughs> oh, there we go. See Hazel Street. Okay. You see Hazel Street? It's down at the bottom. So he was there at Hazel Street. You see where he's coming? So hold on a second. I got... <coughs> Rain or shine, you got to do a YouTube show. <laughs> 
<laughs> Even when you're sick. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to Hazel Street. So now Mark is on Hazel Street. It's right at the bottom. He turns left on that the um, Mineral Springs Mountain Road. He comes to, now what you really want to pay attention to is see the interstate is right there. He's there about the same time. Rhonda is coming through that location. And also possibly Greg is coming through that location. Now, this is where things get kind of tricky. Uh, and, I, and I say this because People don't realize how much effort goes into trying to analyze crime um, so that you don't understand what's really going on. All right. Rhonda is coming home from her friend's house down here. She comes to this location. If she turns right, she's going up to her. This is where her parents live, right here. That's her home, right here. She will be coming down here, down the interstate, get off on this intersection, and turn right to go to her home. Let's go back to... Uh, so confusing. Oh, as a matter of fact, here's a good picture. All right. She will be taking this exit. All right, I just showed you that she will be taking the exit. This would be her at the stop sign. She would go this way to her home. If you notice, the interstate is on her left at that point. There's a car under there. And then there's a reason for it that somebody saw a vehicle under there, a blue vehicle that looked like Greg's vehicle. Okay. Under there. She would be coming off the interstate here. She should turn right to go to her home. But does she? Meanwhile, on the other side of the interstate, let me go to the other side of the interstate. No, oh, that's not the picture. Other side of the interstate. Okay, so if you look up there, um, if you see with that 40, oh, what is that? The 40, whatever that, 40, I guess 40 sign. If you see that little 40 sign, that's where she would be get off the interstate coming from her friend's house. She would be then turning right. She'd be coming off the interstate. You see that that in the middle and right in the middle, you'll see where the, see where the bridge is there, the, uh, or, or, you know, the overpass. Um, that's where she came up to the stop sign. She would turn left to go into the underpass, which is where you see the, the car that was blue, or she would go right toward her home, okay? Now, uh, her and, and meanwhile, her, her friend's boyfriend was down at the bottom on Hazel Street. He would be turning left. You see how everybody's coming to that overpass. Greg, Greg's vehicle, or one that looks like Greg's vehicle, shall we say, was under the overpass. Uh, and you, you, you have um, her best friend's boyfriend coming on Hazel Street, turning left toward the overpass. Meanwhile, <sighs> Rhonda is coming down 40 and getting off that exit, getting to that stop sign where she should turn right to go to her home. The question is, does she or does she turn left to go to the underneath the overpass to meet Greg? See how complicated this is? All right. Now, let me see if I can explain all of this to you. All right. Let me see. I'm trying to look back on my uh, on my profile. Uh, okay, hold on. All right, let's see. This is what I wrote on my profile 20-some years ago, okay? Uh, yeah, 20 years ago. With, with limited information, mind you. Okay. She was going home, supposedly. She, Greg was, uh, he was pissed at her. Okay. Um, she stopped. It appears she stopped. Now, she did not. Now, there's a theory that she just stopped at the stop sign and came on up the road, but somebody just shot her for no reason from way back there without doing anything. But the problem is in her car, there were many items found. Items that both that Greg had, along with that blue, that blue blade, that blue jacket, right? And the white, the gray jacket, which is really odd. So she stopped, and they those items weren't in the vehicle before she went to the party. So how did they get in her vehicle? So 
and there's a 15 minute gap. When she leaves um, her friend's house, she should have just turned the corner and been home earlier. But there's a 15 minute gap here. And people saw this vehicle here on the wrong side of the road underneath the um, the highway, the overpass. Now, it was a kind of a rainy, crappy, cold night. If you were going to meet somebody, where would you meet them on a rainy, crappy, cold night? I would do it under an overpass. Now, I do not know what was on the other side of the overpass because this was on the wrong. This car's on the wrong side of the road. Is there no room on the other side to pull over? I do not know. Uh, so did this person pull over to this side because that's where you pull over? And then in this case, if she were meeting someone, she would go down here and pull over right in front of that vehicle. That's what I believe happened. Now listen to what I have to say. All right. Uh, she had rolled, the, the window was halfway down, which means she rolled the window down which is a rainy night, she would not have rolled the window down. And it was, by the way, one of these old timer things, you know, if she, unless she was talking to somebody. And then there were things that appeared in her vehicle on top of her normal stuff, which means somebody gave her something, which the things that they wanted to return to her, I would think. All right. And she wouldn't have stopped. This is, this is dark outside. It's a rainy, dark night. Why the hell would she stop on, pull into this location and stop for anybody, but someone she knew? All right, so here's what I wrote. All right. For all, following this, wait a minute, what is my logic? It says follow my logic. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, I have a bit about trajectory of the bullet. I think I want to get to that later. So anyway, somebody shot her. So following logic, I said, following what I told the police, for some reason, a Rhonda rolled rolled down and then rolled up her window. Although it was, uh, when I was told it was all the way up, but it was apparently halfway up. There's reasons for that too. For, uh, she was not wearing her seatbelt. This is interesting. She's driving home and she's very, very, she's one of those girls that does what the right thing to do. She gets here. Why would she take her seatbelt off to just drive home? No, she took her seatbelt off because she went down here. Now, if you roll your window down, why would you take your seatbelt off unless you got out of the vehicle? I believe she left the vehicle. Nobody talks about her leaving the vehicle. I believe she did. I believe she rolled the window down and somebody said to her, hey, let's talk, blah, 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 blah. Come and get your crap or whatever. She got out of the vehicle. That's why her seatbelt was not on. And this is very important to exactly what happened. All right. Now, let me read what I have to say here. Okay. Uh, um, she was not wearing a seatbelt. For some reason, okay, so she stopped on the road, side of the road for some reason at one o'clock in the morning. This fact eliminates a stranger homicide. She's not going to stop for no reason at all, unless it was like a flashing lights for a police officer, but I just don't I believe that happened. She wouldn't have stopped at one o'clock in the morning to talk to a stranger. This eliminates also the possibility the shooter was standing there with a rifle at the bottom of the ramp. Uh, Rhonda would hardly have stopped to talk to an individual armed with a noticeable long gun. <laughs> She's not an idiot. Um, therefore, Rhonda must have stopped to talk to the known individual who did not exhibit a gun at the time she stopped and conversed with them. So whoever she met with over here was not like standing there with a weapon, you know. This is very important because it shows how things went down. The fact Rhonda stopped to talk to someone can account for the window being rolled down and up or partway up. It does not account for the seatbelt being off unless she got out of the vehicle. Since it was raining, it is somewhat unlikely she would have chosen to get out of the vehicle in the rain. Um, also, should an argument come to a cl uh, close at the side of the road, forward of the ramp, Rhonda would have been well down the road before the shoot had time to go to the vehicle and remove a gun and shoot her. Therefore, Rhonda's car must have been farther from the shooter's car location than the shooter. I, I believe she was parked in front of his vehicle. Okay. Then he came up to her vehicle dump stuff into it. it. When she took off, I believe she U-turned because, you know, it's funny when I read my own profile from 20 years ago, it said she U-turned. I had no idea why. <laughs> I'm like, why did she U-turn? I believe it's because she U-turned to go home. And, and it's funny because it's not, it's not written here. And I don't know whether I knew it then, or I didn't know it then. But when I just examined all the maps, I'm like, holy crap. Yeah. She was probably pulled over here. And then when it was all done and said and done, she you turn to go here. So that seemed to be, I guess I was right for whatever reasons I was right. All right. After she parked the car under the, so it says here, she suggested she pulled the car over there. 
uh, uh, it says here I'm heading in the opposite direction. I, I don't know what that actually means. Opposite direction of this car. I don't. Maybe I maybe I did screw up there. Um, after she parked the car under the overpass, and nobody ever said she did, but it was raining, and she had to talk to somebody. She said, no, 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 stand out there in the rain, and talk to him where there's no place. So you might as well go under the underpass, or the overpass. Um, she would have taken off the seatbelt and gotten out of the car. She did not have her seatbelt on. I believe she had a reason to take the seatbelt off. The two would have talked. The argument would have escalated until the point where Rhonda had had enough. Angry, she would have gotten back into her car, preparing to get out of there. So once uh, they got, there's stuff in her car that shouldn't be there unless Greg was there to give it to her, like the blue jacket. So that's why Craig is a good suspect. Um, first of all, she wouldn't have stopped for anybody but Greg. Secondly, that the stuff that he had that he had in his possession that was hers ended up in her car. All right. So now she gets going to get out of there. She you she knows it's raining. She she turns goes into first. She U turns the car. She goes into second. She's going now. She's leaving here and she's going here. Now there is a hill. There's a very as a hill of some sort. Uh, I, can't, I can't see it on the map, but they say there's a hill uh, going going the other direction toward her house. So once she turned turned around here and crossed over here and was going up, then she. Uh, let's see if I have a map of that. I might. Okay. Um, yeah. So here is now if she, she, she was obviously, um, she went under that overpass and then she turned around and went up to Hillcrest street, Southeast or was trying to, <clears throat> that's where she lived. Um, mm, this is, do I have a visual? Yeah, this is, this is the best I can come up. It's now called something else. It's the weird names, but anyway, you see the overpass and that, there is she's going up is apparently where the car, she was shot. So it's on a, it's on an incline. Okay. Um, and she is, she went up the hill the, because there was an ample amount of time while Rhonda is getting back in the car, rolling up the window, at least part way, or maybe she never did. Um, maybe at that point, maybe she never did. Cause she was just trying to get away from the guy. Okay. So maybe I've been halfway up. And then she just u turn and got the hell out of there. Never bothered to put a seatbelt on because we know when you're in a rush, you might put your seatbelt. She was only going up the road to her parents' house. I don't know that she was worried about the seatbelt issue at that point. I don't think she, I think she just got the hell out of there. She just turned and left uh, in the direction of home. She changed gears. And as she changed gears and was going up the hill, she, the gear was in, in neutral when she was changing gears. That's when she was shot. Me, while she was doing that, that gave him time to go to his vehicle, open the trunk up, take out a, a gun, and then shoot her. All right. That's what I think happened. Now, there's an issue here of, let's let, 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 I'm going to stop here. I'm going to go back to what happened after she was shot, but I want to talk about the gray, the gray sweatshirt and why this is, is an issue for people. Okay. The gray sweatshirt, supposedly was in the possession of her marks mark turner her, her friend's boyfriend he left her she dropped her off and he was close to the location um that he could have seen greg but that but that sweatshirt ended up in her car now either jill was wrong and he actually returned it to her the day before but he says he can't remember. He, he had had an accident. He was on, was on medications. He claims he can't remember anything because of the medications. Okay. Uh, or did he actually arrive at the crime scene or before the crime scene? Did he actually walk up and give her that? Say, hey, there's Greg, Greg, and, Greg, Greg and Rhonda. They're on the side of the road. And he walks up and says, hey, here, hey I was going to give this back to you, but you're both here. So here. And that was chucked into the vehicle. At that point, I believe that is likely what happened. At that point, did Mark then walk away, say, hey, I don't, what's up? What's going on between you two? I'm, I'm not involved in that. Walks away, gets in his vehicle and drives away. And later finds out she's been killed and doesn't want to admit he was there. Very possible. Did he, was he actually, did he, you know, what, I don't think he was more involved. I don't think he had any reason to harm Miranda. But I do think it's possible he knew that Greg did. But that was they. Some people say he wasn't his best friend or anything. But he was at the if he was at the crime scene, knew what happened, just didn't was like freaked and didn't want to say anything. 
his teenager. Maybe it's just that he just didn't he'd want to pretend he didn't see anything and didn't know anything. And that's the way it's been. He is a good person to still talk to. He's never given up any information over the years that he was there and he returned the, that, that, that gray shirt that night. But I mean, Hey, it's in her car. So you kind of got to think because he was near that location, he might've just run into them. Maybe he knows more than he says. That's, that's a theory on that. Now, what happened after, so she goes up the hill, she is shot. And here is where I differ, I differ from many, some people, including Ken Maines on whether it was an accidental shooting or a real shooting. If Greg met with her at that location to return stuff, here's the thing. He has an ideation of killing her if she doesn't please him. Ken Maines believes that it was accidental, that he was just, you know, when she drove away, he just picked up the gun and just shot stupidly at the car. And many people think it's just to scare her. There's no reason to scare her. I don't, I don't understand the scaring issue at all because shooting at somebody's car serves no purpose, really. What scare her for what? They already broke up. What's that going to prove anything? Um, that make any sense to me. Um, if he brought the, the weapon with him, he already had ideations of using the weapon. And my belief is this, his ideation was what is very common for boyfriends and girlfriends who are breaking up, especially psychopathic boyfriends. Um, if you, I'm going to try, I'm going to have that last attempt. I'm going to meet you under that damn place. And I will give you back your crap. But what I really want you to do is say, I don't want it back. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I love you. I'm not going to, I'm not breaking up with you. And if she does that, all is good. But if she doesn't do that, if she really walks away from me and says, I don't want you, that's not going to happen. If I can't have you, no one can have you. You cannot walk away from me. So you bring the gun as backup. You'd hope you never have to use it because you want to get together back together with her. You think she's going to give in because she's always given in. And then she doesn't. And you are pissed. You go back and you grab your gun and you say, I warned you. And you shoot at her. Now, I don't think for a minute he shot at the trunk of the car. Okay, let's look at the picture of the, uh, the trunk of the car here. The theory is the guy shot straight at the trunk of the car. What? To just scare her? Whatever. Heck no. She was going up a hill. My belief is he shot at right at the back window, intending to kill her. And oh, now, mind you, he wasn't a sharpshooter. He's an idiot. And he's a teenager. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, he couldn't have done that because he wasn't capable. No, the, he thinks he's capable. He doesn't even think at all. I mean, he's not clear thinking. So he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take her out. He pulls his gun out. He shoots at the back window, but the car is on an incline. By the time he shoots, because it's quite a distance and he's not a sharpshooter. By the time the car gets up here, he shoots it. And he does hit the trunk of the vehicle. In theory, he just missed. He meant to shoot her in the head, but would he have been successful? In reality, probably not because he's not that good. But people people do stupid stuff and they intend to kill the person. I'm going to kill you. And they miss. Normally speaking, he would have shot and she just would have driven away and he would have missed. Because it was on an incline and he, I believe he was aiming at the back window, at her head. Because why else, you know, I don't believe he's shooting at her trunk to scare her. What's the point? That's just nonsense. He always said he would kill her. He would kill, uh, shoot you with my shotgun. He had a rifle. Okay. So he shoots at her, but the car's on an incline. It doesn't hit her in the head. It hits the trunk. And by just bizarreness, it ends up shoot, you know, going through her heart. 
Now, some say there's a ricochet, blah, 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 but this is very hard to figure out exactly the technicalities of how the bullet went through the car. He, I believe he shot at her head. Not, whether he thought he was going to be successful or not, I don't know. He wasn't successful at hitting her in the head, but he hit the trunk because that's where the car was going and it happened to kill her. Now, the, tr the car then... She's in, she's in, she's, tra she's, she's trying to go down to a third um, and she's going through neutral and she gets hit at that moment. So the car doesn't go into third. So it goes into neutral. So after she's shot and incapacitated, the car just rolls back into the ditch. Okay. So now the car is in the ditch. All right. Let's look at the car in the ditch. Okay. See the car in the ditch. It's kind of like this. Now what's important about this is there are, one of the witnesses says, besides seeing the blue vehicle, says he sees a man that looks about the size of, of, of Greg um, and also um, about his height and with about his hair color, standing by the vehicle. Now, he thinks somebody's drunk and they ran off the road. He sees a woman kind of like laying, leaning over onto the door, but he thinks she's just drunk and just drove off the road. Now, when the police get there, the guy's gone. When the police get there, the door is open. The, not the, the driver's side door is open. And Rhonda is lying on the ground in the ditch with her head up against the tire, back tire. Now, I did not know this when I, uh, when I did my analysis. So one of the things I said was that because the car was like this, if the guy went there and opened the door, she was laying on the door and she would pitch out. I still believe that's true. She would pitch out. I did not know she was lying up against the tire, which means somebody had to move her a little bit and lay her against the tire. Uh, there's some statement about her arms being out, some pose bullshit. That's just nonsense. Um, guy might have picked, pulled her up against the tire. Now, this is very important as far as him grabbing her under the arms and putting her against the tire because there's a DNA issue on that. But right now, we got her being put up against the tire. Why? Was the person trying to save her life? Was the person just as stunned that he had done such a thing, which wanted to know if she was alive or dead? Or was he wanting to make sure she was dead? Three options. If it was Greg, if it was Greg who shot her, intending, in my opinion, to kill her, even if he sucked at it and it was unlikely, but still. And then he sees, oh my God, the car backs off and falls in the ditch. He goes, holy crap, I hit her. He doesn't know that went through the trunk. He's not that bright. <laughs> oh, my God, did I hit her? Now, the next thought is, in my opinion, if I had done that, maybe I have a criminal mind, but I would think, I don't know she's dead. I just met her, gave her shit back to her, and now she's lying with a gunshot wound in her on the side of the road. She's going to wrap my butt out. I'm going to go to prison. I might well go and check, open up that door. She falls out. I pull her up, grab her, put her up against the thing and look at her and say, is she alive or dead? Oh my God, she's dead. <sighs> okay. I'm out of here. If she had been alive, would he have finished her off? Because she could rat him out. We'll never know. Because she was dead on contact. Uh, but I strongly believe that the intent was shoot to kill. That he thought he would accomplish is another issue. But that he did, uh, whoever did it, and the car rolled back, and then he checked on her. I think it was to make sure she was dead. Not because he was offering, rendering aid. Not because he was shocked. Well, he might have been shocked that it was successful. But to make sure she would not rat him out. Because if she was alive, my God, she would say, hey, I just met Greg. And then he would go down. Uh, do I have any proof of this? No. You know why? Because no gun was found. No GSR was found, gunshot residue. No one spent a lot of time at Greg's house trying to figure out what was going on. By the time they ever investigated Greg, he had already exhibited bizarre behaviors. Um, let's see. What, what exar, exar, bizarre behaviors do we have? Um he had, he had acted weird after uh, Rhonda was dead. He was throwing up. He wouldn't look people in the eye. All kinds of things. But 
supposedly, according to his daddy and mommy, he was home in bed when this all happened. And uh, even though he had just spoken to Rhonda on the phone and uh, she was, he claimed he thought she was at home because she said she would call him when he got, when she got home. So he claimed for years, oh yeah, she, she called, I thought she was at home. But later on, he admitted he knew she was at her friend's house. So he's a liar. And he therefore was the one person who knew where she was when she was leaving her friend's house. He knew exactly the route she would take home. Only person that would know. So they were breaking up and all her, the stuff ended up in the back of her vehicle. That shows to me that he did indeed meet her on the way. He knew she was going home. He said, let me meet you. I, okay, fine. I'll give you back a crap, whatever. And they met. He's the only person that knew. Now, Charles McDowell, his daddy, the, 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 the pastor, did he know what was going on? I don't know that he knew what was going to happen. But what, if his son left the house and he came back and then turns out that he said, oh, my God, you know, everything's gone wrong. I shot it. I shot, yeah, I kind of took the rifle with me. Daddy knew. I don't know if mommy knew, but daddy knew. Now, it's interesting. Charles McDowell, the father, apparently went out looking for Rhonda because supposedly she hadn't arrived home. So suddenly he goes out looking for her. Not, not, not her boyfriend, but he sends daddy. Daddy goes running around in his vehicle and sees the crime scene and all that kind of stuff. He's out running about. I say he knows something. All right. Then, interesting enough, after all this happens, and this is a, a period of time where if there was a, a if there was a family weapon involved, Daddy had time running around, supposedly helping his son, finding out what happened to his girlfriend, had time to ditch the 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 right the the weapon or put the weapon in a place where the police would not come to his house and find it and later be able to retrieve it. Now, interesting enough, Daddy, remember Daddy? He also, owned a, he also owned a plane. And right after this happened, he supposedly flew away to pick up some people to bring them back for Christmas. Hey, your son's girlfriend was just murdered. <laughs> Is this a good time for relatives to come? He's flying down there. Now, some people think that he then retrieved the weapon and chucked it from the, the plane. Don't know. I have no idea. That's a theory. Do I think he killed... Rhonda, as maybe maybe uh, Judy Hinson thinks, because he's a creepy dude. I don't think so. I think too much. The only one who really knew that Rhonda was leaving her friend's house at that time was Greg, her boyfriend. He was the one who was on the outs with her. This st the stuff ended up in his in her car. Now, could Daddy have said, "Hey, Greg, I'll take that crap for you. I'll meet her and give her back her stuff and taken her out." Yeah, but I don't believe it happened. I think that she wouldn't have stopped for him because she was already creeped up by him. Um, I think if he wanted to offer her for, you know, because he might have been a little bit handsy, um, I think he would have found some other way to deal with it. Besides which, she was breaking up with Greg. He'd go, good thing. Now, at the funeral, he was quite, he gave the, he did the funeral for her and he was not very nice. He said things like, I think she could be in hell. I mean, who says that crap? He, he said, no, Greg will get over it. And, you know. I think he is indeed protecting his son. I do. Now, Greg, mind you, uh, during the first uh, first uh, polygraph, he did take a first polygraph, and he came back inconclusive. Second one, he actually passed. He had some issues about taking a polygraph because he said, well, you know, I know I'm innocent. Well, he might have been innocent of the actual homicide, but I think he knows who did it. Um, I think. Do I think he covered for his son? Very likely. Now, the interesting thing is the only people that know where Greg was that night are – or his daddy, his mommy, and, and him, and maybe maybe a sibling, and nobody's talking. So within that group, the truth may lie. Now, as far as the boy, the, the boyfriend of you know um, Mark, Mark Turner, who is a boyfriend of her best friend, did he know something? Maybe. And people are thinking, why don't you go after this guy? Because he probably was there at the time, at, or at least before that, he would know if Greg showed up at the scene. I agree. I think that's 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 very valuable to know. Um, and, uh, I, as far as, um, if, if Greg is, say is a top suspect, he's been the top suspect pretty much 
uh, myself and pretty much I think everybody has ever looked at this crime. And even Ken Mains thinks that that's probably him too. Um, but Ken Mains thinks it's, a, you know, was, was accident, more of an accident than a, a premeditated homicide. Although he can't explain why then he would bring a gun <laughs> to have an accident with. Hmm. Okay, I have a problem with that. But um, one of the things I did, I, you know, I did make some recommendations about how to chat with Greg. I won't go into them there, but um, yeah, I won't go into them. But this, is it a solvable crime at this point? No, I don't think so. Um, unless I got an absolute confession. Um, if, if Mark, Mark Turner would come forward and say, "Hey, you know, I, w I did return that 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 that's, that that jacket, and and Greg was there. That might help, but we still have no weapon. We still have no GSR. We still have no proof, except for you know maybe a statement from Mark Turner if he made one um, at, at this late date um, or a confession. Um, why do things go south in cases like this? They go south because the proper things weren't done right at the beginning." And when that's not happening, if what I say all the time, that's why I want more training for detectives. If I'd been there, I'd say, hey, within 48 hours, I would have said, hey, get over to the <laughs> get over the McDowell house. There's something's wrong. Because the last person who have contact with Rhonda Hinson was Greg McDowell, her boyfriend. Clearly, she wouldn't have met under that bridge for any reason. Look at the bridge. She's not going to go there for a stranger. And there's 15 minutes of missing time. She met someone. Who would she meet? I don't think it's creepy, creepy daddy. I think she's meeting her boyfriend. And then she is shot. Who knows what happened? Probably a creepy boyfriend and a creepy father. And maybe Mark Turner. Where were you as far as honing in right away, looking for the weapon and the GSR and getting the statements from these people? They weren't in my report. I can guarantee you that they weren't in my report. So I could come up with whom I, whom, who I think did it and why I think it happened and how I think it happened. I could not prove it because the evidence is not there. It's too much time in looking directions and, and mucking around with a whole bunch of possibilities that weren't probabilities. You go for the probabilities first and the possibilities later. I'm very much in campaigns on that. Go to the probabilities first, possibilities later. And if you don't do that, you know, you got probabilities of 95% and you waste your time on 5% of possibilities, you, the, the evidence is going to disappear on you. So this is this crime. I, I, you know, I look back at the Hinsons, talking with Judy Hinson just recently, 40 some years. Let me show you a picture. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get emotional too often, but where's the picture? No, oh, ma'am, I don't, uh, did I write that? Oh, the picture's not here. Okay, um, they've kept her, they've kept her room all these years so they can remember her just as things were the day she disappeared, the day she was murdered, not she disappeared, the day she was murdered. 40 years. They have waited for justice. I don't think justice is coming. I'm sorry, Judy and Bobby, I don't. I don't care what every, every new sheriff says. Justice was lost in the first 48 hours because they didn't hone in on who they should have paid attention to. Unless there's some incredibly lucky thing. Oh, let me talk about the incredibly lucky thing. But uh, it's, been a, it's been a couple of years now. Here, here's, here's the supposedly... All right, so apparently there was some DNA. Uh, underneath, uh, they found some test results indicated that DNA not belonging to the decedent was found under both armpit areas, likely the, quote, signature of the person. Uh, stop using signature. The person removed it from the automobile. I, I agree with that. Somebody, you know, after she, I personally think she pitched out, but then I think she was pulled up and put against the tire to examine to see if she was alive. The person, of the, the person who did this might have been sweating if they weren't wearing gloves. Of course, again, we're talking about it's, it's not nice out there. It's cold. It's rainy. I don't know if the person had gloves on or not. But if they had just their hands and they moved her, 
Their DNA might well be under her armpits. There would be DNA. And the new sheriff was like, hey, I'm going after this. Nothing has come of it. And I wonder, when did this happen? When did they get the DNA? 2007. It was, the Rhonda Henson sweater was... <sighs> It was sent to the lab. They indicated there was DNA not belonging to the decedent. 2007. I, we still don't know whether any of the McDowell's, Greg McDowell or his daddy, were ever DNA'd to see if it matched. I don't have any information on that. 2007. This is 2000. I'm sorry, what, where are we at? 2023, I forgot where we're even at. 16 years later, still got nothing? That's possible, there's simply nothing in the DNA that matched anybody. So, you know, it could, so it's gonna, I, I don't know. They said there was something that wasn't, wasn't Rhonda's DNA there? Well, she was at a dance. Maybe that's where the DNA came from. And maybe the person who pulled her out of the car had gloves on. I don't know. But I'm going to say this in 2023. I don't have a lot of hope. I don't. Uh, and, and, you know, people like to keep saying there's hope. But, you know, I always think hope lies with proper training back when in the first 48. It does. That's where hope lies. Don't, don't, don't. I mean, I understand with the family is always going to have hope. And Judy and Bobby are always going to have hope. It's their daughter. To them, their daughter is still that young girl, just graduated from high school, who's coming home that night. And she's not. Because I don't think it was handled properly back in the day. And by the time I came into it in 2000, what was it, 2001? I could give my opinion, my profile. So what? They went, geez, we think she's right. <laughs> so what? Uh, never heard from them again. They never published it um, until uh, until Larry did. I mean, I didn't, myself, I forgot I even gave it. Because that's the way things work. Okay. I'm getting emotional now. All right. Let me, let me check your comments. All right. All right. Ah. All right, let's see what you have to say. Um, uh, I'm going backwards now. Uh, deathbed confession. Well, you know, if I were Charles McDowell and didn't commit the crime and were dying, I would admit I did the crime. Why not? I get my son off. My son could then live the rest of his life because he's in the 60s now. But that doesn't mean it's true. People think de deathbed confessions are true. They're not necessarily true. They're somebody's explanation of something. And you have to put that with a grain of salt as well to see why they're giving those deathbed confessions. And too many people think every death, deathbed confession, it has to be 100% true because the person's about to meet God. Oh, God. Get out of here. Get out of here. And no, it doesn't have to be. Um, Kelly says she talked to Greg on the phone then immediately had to leave to go he told her to meet him I would think so I mean there is no other explanation why the stuff got into her car and why she would stop in the middle of the night at that location absolutely not um, has Greg gotten into trouble since no but he's apparently been married a whole heck of a lot of times so I'm going to say he doesn't do well with women um, when you talk about oh let me, let me point this out um, when you're talking about A situation where it's a situational crime. Um, even if you look back at uh, uh, I'm thinking of Drew Peterson, Drew Peterson killed most. They're theorizing two of his wives and attempted to kill a third one. Okay, so Drew Peterson was he a serial killer? If he killed more than one of his wives, now they've never proven he killed more than one of his wives. He's in prison for one. But, you know, the, the, the third one vanished. <coughs> and the second, first one says he tried to kill her. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me again. Um, is he a serial killer? My 
Answer is no, he's not a serial killer. He's a situational killer. He has no intention of killing anybody until the situation arises where he finds that they're getting in his way. Again, my statement on psychopaths, you're either useful or you're in the way. As long as you're useful, I could be married to you for 20, 30 years. And then you got in my way. Now you're, now I'm going to knock you off. So there are situational killers. I would think if Greg is guilty of this crime, he's a situational killer. There are many guys who have killed their girlfriends, wives, or women have killed their boyfriends, husbands, and they haven't committed that crime again because at that, the, 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 the the opportunity or the need to kill never never appeared again. So they were like, I'm good. <laughs> as long as they get what they want. So no, has Greg ever been in trouble? As far as I know, no, but I think he's been married. I, think I was told five times, but I don't know the accuracy of that. So he may not do well with women, but he hasn't had a reason to kill. Him. And also he's grown up now. I can't say that he committed this crime. I'm just saying, of all the suspects, he certainly comes up top. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay, Aunt Dini. Rhonda wouldn't make the accusation she didn't about her boyfriend's dad if it wasn't true. Okay. Let's talk about teenagehood and skeezy men. <laughs> um, yeah, they're out there. Um, and I say this from experience. Um, I had a moment in time where I was babysitting. I, I don't know how old I was. Uh, I'm trying to think because I couldn't drive, so I didn't drive to his house. I had to be 15 maybe. I, 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 I babysat for this man and his wife and their one daughter. And they drank a lot, like, like heavy scotch drinkers. And though, and I remember they would pour like scotch and they would drink like fish. And then when they came home at night, the guy would drive me home to my parents' house. I always think my parents had no clue of this crap. It wasn't very far. I admit it was, you know, he drove one block out to the main road and which was a tiny road maybe five blocks and then into my neighborhood. So I'm not, I'm not going to say he endangered my life by drinking and driving, but I do remember when he left with his wife to go on his outings with her, you know, for the evening, they all had a, they, they walked to the car with a glass of scotch in their hand. And when he brought me home, he had a glass of scotch in his hand <laughs> and he put it in the cup holder. I remember this. And then he drove me home. And he got a bit handsy one time. I remember how handsy he got. Now, he didn't write me, but he got handsy and romantic, shall we say. And he was obviously drinking. So it's when people drink, they get a little bit more loose. Uh, and, you know, and so I was 15 years old. I was an attractive young girl. And he was like, hey, we know that kind of thing. And I remember thinking, hey. But I was also flattered because I was stupid. And so, anyway, he never did more. Yeah, when I was babysitting. So, but did he do that? Yes, he did. Did I tell my parents? No, I didn't. Um, I also was 17 years old. Oh, was going to a karate location where my teacher was a, a Korean fellow. Because um, of Korean karate. Um, so... So the fact is, Korean is not not the issue here. But I remember he somehow we ended up in a car together, and he got handsy, and he was in his thirties, thirty something, and I was seventeen. He got handsy. That happens. It happens. For I don't know if women will admit this crap, but it happens all the time. Now, did it destroy my life? No. Did I go home and tell my parents? I, I, I was like, he touched me, and I uh, I got to take a shower. No, I was like, huh, that was weird. That was a Kind of interesting. Yeah. Didn't didn't see him again. I mean, I never got in a car with him again. <laughs> but was he handsy? Yes. So do I believe Rhonda might have had some handsy issues with the old pastor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I, 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 the fact she wanted to take a shower in the middle of the night, 
that concerns me way more than it concerns Ken Maines because I'm a female and I know that. That's weird. The fact that you wouldn't want to get up shower makes me feel like he got excessively handsy. And she's not actually telling the whole story. I don't know how handsy. When I say handsy, <laughs> I'm just saying that because that's a way to say it. I don't think he raped her necessarily, but he might have gotten a little bit friendlier than she's admitting. And it's just grossed her out. And it's her boyfriend's father, so it really grossed her out. That's why she didn't want to be around the dude. Do I think he killed her for it? No, I think he probably think he can just get away with it. Um, and once his son dumped, she dumped him or her son dumped her, he would care less. He'd just move on. I don't think he killed her over it. Um, that's why I don't think Charles McDowell is guilty of the homicide. Do I think he covered for his son? Yes, I do. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, what else you have to say? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Scarlett says, the pastor said that. So disrespectful, especially with the parents said they should have got up and slugged him. He was extremely disrespectful about uh, Rhonda, saying she might have gone to hell. And, you know, he had a lot of things. Like, my son's going to get over it. As you know, it was like, Clearly, he had no respect for the girl, um, and probably because he wanted to exonerate his own son. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that the Hinsons weren't happy. The Hinsons have always disliked that man. They've always thought he had something to do with it. But I think it's something to do with covering up. You got three people in that house. Daddy, Mommy, uh, as far as four people. Daddy, Mommy, Greg, and his sister. Yeah, four people. I, I think one of them was asleep, so we'll have no clue. So I'm going to go with Daddy, Mommy, and Greg. And and the problem with alibis, he had an alibi. He was home with his family, and his parents will vouch for him. What does that mean? Not much, especially you know, his father's out running around looking like he's doing damage control afterwards. So that's not a good alibi. An alibi of a girlfriend, wife, husband, family is always garbage alibi. And you can never believe it. You have to say that, okay, that's what they said, but we, we don't know that it's true. Um, an alibi to me is like you were seen on camera someplace. You couldn't have done it. Uh, that kind of alibi. You were out of the country. You couldn't have done it. But when you say, I was home with my family, that's meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, Mitchie says, I reckon the creepy pastor mentioned hell at her funeral and in spite because she rejected his advances may well be true. He may well have not appreciated the fact that she didn't appreciate him. This is very true. Um, let's see. Um, Marie says, was it, was it as planned as Mark being in on it? I, 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 I in no way do I think Mark, Mark Turner was in on it. Um, there are some people that believe Mark Turner may have actually committed the crime, but, that I, there's no reason that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and certainly the pastor isn't going to call cover up for Mark Turner um, that he may know what could have happened or maybe he knew what did happen and he just didn't know how to speak out about it. I believe, but no, not in no way do I believe that he committed the crime himself or was in on the crime. He had no reason to want to harm Rhonda at all. Um, let's see what else you have to say. Um, oh, uh, Maurice says, I thought he, she was taken out of the car to try and revive her, but it makes sense that it could just as well be to try and make sure she was dead. Yeah. You know, the funny thing about trying to put yourself in the mind of, of a killer is, is do we, are we basing that on evidence or are we basing it on just a, a possibility and this, in this case, the possibility is he took her out to see if she was okay and try to save her because he accidentally shot at her car and killed her because he didn't mean to kill her. But the, my opinion, the probability is he did indeed mean to kill her. And he wanted, at that point, when her, the car went back, he realized he did hit her. He wanted to make damn sure she wouldn't rat him out. Uh, I would go with that one as a better option, as a better probability. I can't prove it. That's, that's what, you know, this is what, this is what comes down to evidence, you know, and 
you know, in the long run, let's say they actually found the gun and they found GSR and Greg, let's say they all got all this, they got them into court, we would still never know absolutely whether he shot just out of anger and never meant to hurt her or he shot purposely to kill her. And I'm sure the defense attorney would go with, it was, oh, he never meant to kill her. And the prosecution would be me. <laughs> and I'd say, the guy had a gun with him. The, the gun wasn't accidentally with him. The gun was with him in case she never, she refused to come back. And the fact that he had the gun with him, walked back to his vehicle, took the gun out and shot at her. When she was going up a hill, when he probably shot at the window and miscalculated, shows to me it's a premeditated homicide. I will go with murder one. And I'll stand by that. That's what I would do as a prosecutor. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, uh, let's see what you have to say. Uh, Marie says, Pat, are you saying that the idea that someone shoots to scare someone is just an excuse? That they will in general want to kill some, kill the person? Um There are times when someone might want to scare someone. But I don't see that this makes any sense at this time. That That's my problem with it. It's like, what's it going to scare her about now? <laughs> you know, um, it makes absolutely zero sense. Because he also brought the, the gun with him for a reason. I don't think the gun was accidentally just happened to be in the trunk of the car. That would be odd. So I believe he brought it with him with the purposes of she better stay with me. She, he said that before. If you don't stay with me, I will kill you. If you don't smile, I will kill you. He's, that's his ideation. Now, that he thought he would carry it out? I don't know. You know, we have, if, people, people have ideations that may never be carried out. But then again, they might be. How do we know which way it's going to go? And how do they know which way it's going to go? The problem a lot of people have with uh, violent crimes is they say, well, they could have walked away. They could have made a different decision. Well, they could have, but they didn't. In that moment, they made their choice. And if they had the time to think about that choice, and he, if this was Greg, he had time to walk back to his vehicle, open a trunk, take out a weapon, and shoot. He had time. That's premeditated homicide. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, that's an interesting point. Sandra says, I remember, uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm not sure we're talking about the same case. <laughs> Sometimes when you go back to do the chats, you're like, oh, you're not even talking about this case. But as far as remorse goes, Greg's behavior after the crime was odd. Uh, it was odd. It was enough to make people say, what the heck's wrong with him? He doesn't seem to care about the fact is, you know, he had, he had violent, like he threw up and stuff on that night. But after that, he didn't seem to have a lot of um, concern. Now, also Greg, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mark, Jill said that after this happened, Mark had really weird, in the morning, they went over at seven, I think it was 7 a.m. in the morning <coughs> and Greg apparently passed some condoms to Mark and said, hide those because I don't want the parents to know I was having sex with her or something. It was just kind of weird. And then Jill said that when she talked to Mark after that, he was like really cold about it. She's like, my best friend has died. He said, I'll get over it. You know, he wouldn't go there and talk about it. And they, bro they broke up. Um, she thought he was like very distant and very cold about the whole thing. Like he wasn't supportive to her when it was her best friend that was killed. And that's why she believes he somehow had something to do, not that he killed uh, Rhonda, but that he knew what happened and that he was, you know, he knew his buddy did it. So, and I don't know if I'll ever find out that, but I would like, I would like to myself. Um, I can't remember the name of the kid who shot through his girlfriend's wall and killed her. He said he wanted to scare her into getting back with him. Possibly. In this case, I just don't, I just don't see it. I mean, we, you know, this is the whole thing. We can make up anything we want now. In the long run, the fact is Rhonda's dead. Somebody shot her and nobody has ever been convicted of it. So her, her parents, Judy and Bobby, 
wonder why there's no justice. Wonder why no one has ever, ever been convicted of this crime. Um, 40 years of fighting. You know, I quite frankly, you know, I've forgotten. You know, I've done a lot of, I mean, I do profiling. I, 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 don't, I don't do advocacy. So some people, you know, when they look at my channel, they're like, you know, you, you know, you make jokes, you laugh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Because I don't do the, now we're going to talk about the serious crime of a, you know, I don't do that because I'm not doing advocacy. Um, I'm not doing, uh, I'm not doing a, um, just a true crime channel where I'm talking about a crime and I wasn't a terrible, I'm talking about methodology, crime scene analysis, profiling. It's been 40 years. I've done a lot of cases in 40 years. And it isn't that I forgot about this case. It's just, for, I didn't realize nothing ever come of it because you know, you do cases and you have, you have to let things go. You know how, how, what it's like to be a profiler and profile a case. And one thing I, I, I truly appreciate about Larry. So when he wrote this, this whole 92 series that I didn't even know he wrote, and he put my profile in it that I didn't even know he had. Um, he's got all these, you know, he, he does a lot. If you read the series, he, he talks a lot about my profile and he's very, he's very polite about, he likes my profile and he thinks I was accurate in most of it. And, you know, from what I knew at the time and I appreciate his, his support because, you know, how many times have I turned a profile in and I never hear a damn thing again. And this is a case where at least I didn't spend money. I, I mean, I gave my free time, I pro bono. A lot of cases, I've actually flown to location, paid for my plane, my hotel, my car, and and I didn't even hear back because that's the way things work. Um, and I have to let things go because if I allow myself to be constantly emotionally attached or attached to how people receive my work, what they say about me, I lose my damn mind. I mean, you know, Families of murder victims, my God, what they have to go through. Because I know what they have to go through. And I know what Judy and Bobby, I can understand. I don't know. And I don't ever want to know what they've gone through in 40 years. Fighting, constantly trying to find somebody to promote the case. I was just one of those people. And... Um, they live with it every day of their life. I only live with a professional aspect. <laughs> I live with a professional aspect. And then I, you know, okay, so somebody stabs me in the back professionally. So somebody rat says something, I mean, just rude about me professionally. I just don't get any response. I lose money. I don't lose a child, for God's sakes. That I don't lose. So I've got nothing to complain about. Nothing. Sorry. I got nothing to complain about in comparison to what they have to deal with. Nothing at all. They can tell me to go jump and I'll be okay with that. So, uh, Michaela says, this case makes me sad. You know, Michaela, the amount of cases I've worked that never go anywhere, that never get any conclusion, it's horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying. That's why we have so many cold case shows. I think they're all mostly worthless. <laughs> you know, they're trying, but most of the time I think they're money makers. But in reality, it's so sad because so many cases like this. I can't I can't tell you how many cases I've dealt with where there's just no there's not that there's no answer, there's just no prosecution. And somebody has to live with that. I mean, losing your child. Your, your, your husband, your wife, to some killer, and then having years after year, decade after decade, fighting to bring somebody to, to some kind of justice. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to even fathom. Okay. Ah, yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> I'm gonna, I don't think I'll put that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I agree, but I don't. <laughs> okay, we'll put it up there. Just because Michaela, I love you. Okay, Andy, she says, Andy, the guy was just a dick, plain and simple. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. And, uh, you know, I watched my granddaughter grow up and she's eight. She asked me the other day, she said, what, how old do I have to be to have a boyfriend? I said, and at least when you're in college, <laughs> what's a grandma to say? I mean, it was terrifying. I'm like, what the heck? You're eight. Who, who the heck is putting this stuff in your mind? Um, man, I don't know. I got, I got nothing. It's just, it's a, it's just, it's just frightening. It's just really frightening. Um. Uh, uh, see, TJ says about. I'm not sure what that means. Cases that weren't prosecuted. Um. Oh, oh, you read my book. Okay, just reading your book was very frustrating. Um, I wrote the you no, know, interesting. CJ, you mentioned that I wrote my book. Um, uh, which is the profiler. The original title was "An American Woman Seeks Justice," but they 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 changed that title and make, made it to "The Profile of My Life Hunting Serial Killers and Psychopaths," which was so disingenuous. And I had no choice because that's what the profile that's what the publisher did, and it was a terrible, terrible title and subtitle. And so people hate my book with a passion because <laughs> they do. I mean, they write terrible things about me all the time. Because like, hey, you know, she says she did all these cases and they didn't get they didn't get prosecuted. But that was the point of the book. But I got I got stabbed in the back on that. I was trying to say that as a profiler, I was trying to show how you could work on these cases. But because a profile is too late, because the first forty eight was gone, because the the detectives hadn't had proper training, that you could you could solve the case, but it would never go to court. Um, Rhonda Henson's case was not in the book. But there's a lot of cases that were, um, and it, it's really sad. Now, one of the cases, uh, Andrea Sincata's case, was in the book. Um, I don't remember what I called her in, in the book. Hmm. But anyway, I had they, they, you know, had uh, uh, you know pseudonyms. Um, Andrea Sincata's case just came to court recently, um, and uh, the guy I profiled as the killer was convicted of murdering her. But at the same hand, they also accused, he claimed that he was hired as a, it was a hit hired by the fiance who was totally innocent. I went to the, I, 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 that, that whole thing. I did a whole uh, show on Anderson Carter. You can, you can find that. If you put in Pat Brown, profile of Pat Brown, Anderson Carter, you come up with that case. It's going to be on 2020. And I think Dateline, uh, they, one of them has uh, contacted me for participation. I've refused. I didn't trust them. Um, and, and, and Chris Johnson, who is the, the, the fiance of the, who, who spent a year with an angle bracelet because he was accused by a serial killer of killing his fiance, which is ridiculous as a hired hit. A whole nother story uh, that never was in the profiler because that didn't happen back then. Um, now he, now he got found not guilty by a jury within one hour. And now they're doing a whole story on a bunch of channels, but I don't trust those media outlets. So I'm not doing it, but, um, a lot of the stories in the book were about the fact that there was no conclusion. But no conclusion doesn't mean that the profile is wrong. The conclusion means that the prosecute there was no way to prosecute, that something went wrong during the either either there was something that went wrong during the investigation, uh, where people weren't trained well enough to look the right direction which I pointed out because it's important to me, not because I hate the detectives or I hate the police agents, but because I want more training for them. It's not their fault. And the second thing was that sometimes things just go that way. And uh, so it's very sad. Most of the cases in the book were not, were not ever prosecuted properly or anybody is found guilty. And I, that was the point I was making, <laughs> but the publisher stabbed me in the back and made it look like this was a completely different title. And people read the book and go, ah, you know, that doesn't make sense. And then they hit me. But anyway, <laughs> that, that is life. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but yeah. Um, Mar Mar Marie says, I'm just going to tag you with my question again, because I'm a curious cat. Are there things about this case that you can't tell us? Um, at this point, uh, Larry has done such a thorough 90, 95 series, 95, and my profile is in there. Um, I would say no, except for my suggestions to the police 
as to how they might do with, deal with the case now that might get some resolution that that is in my profile and that I have not not um, not that I have not given out during the show. That's the only thing uh, how they might pursue it this late in time um, to get some something maybe. That's all. But everything else is pretty much out in the public now. It's been 40 freaking years, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I did not know my profile was in public. It was with the police department. Um, I, I was stunned to find out that he had gotten it. I don't know how he got it. I really don't. I didn't send it to him. I can't even find it. I said I lost it. Somehow I lost it. And, it, and I'm really glad to see it again. Uh, you know, because when you look at a case you did 20 years ago, what day it was 2000 what was it what was it again 2001 i was pretty new in the field at that time and you know it's kind of creepy to look back on some of your really early cases and wonder whether you screwed them all up <laughs> and so i was like i hope this isn't totally stupid um and you know now he's made it public to the entire world and i'm like man this might be a really i might have been a retard you know so anyway <laughs> turned out that he liked the profile and i look back and go Okay, it's a good profile. And based on the fact that I actually didn't have the information he had, I was surprised it came out as well as it did. Uh, but I think that's because the evidence was there. There was enough evidence, in spite of the fact I was missing 50% of everything, that just led me to believing that the top suspect is uh, uh, Greg, uh, the boyfriend, that is the top suspect, Charles, the his father um, is curious, but I just can't see any particular reason or timing that he would have committed this crime. And I can't come up with anybody else. So I can't say that Greg is guilty, but I'm just going to say it's hard to get away from him being a top suspect. That's for sure. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, which of your books do you recommend as a first read? Uh, it, 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 it kind of depends what you're interested in. Um, the profiler shows how I, uh, how I got into the business, how I uh, ended up uh, analyzing cases and how things went the way they did and what I think needs to be done. It was, a very, very, it was just a very heartfelt, honest book, which, um, you know, that's the way it was. It's just the truth. Um, so I think to understand me and what I think should be done, which is training of detectives. Uh, no, that's a good book. Uh, Killing for Sport is more about serial killers and how people have completely romanticized them and, and made up a whole bunch of bull about them. So that's that. Uh, the Murder of Cleopatra is my favorite book um, because I ended up working that on, uh, on the Discovery Channel thing and I got rid of the snake. I uh, proved that she wasn't killed by a cobra. Uh, and I came up, I, I analyzed so much of history. Uh, and that I, I believe I proved that she didn't commit suicide, that she was murdered. Um, I, so much of history is wrong. I just find that is the most fascinating thing I've ever worked on in my life. I believe I want the Murder of Cleopatra book, although it was from a mid-sized publisher and didn't get much publicity. Consequently, nobody knows it even exists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this would change a lot of people's view on history and on Cleopatra. Um, <coughs> and I think, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I have got a cough, which is not quite going away, which to me is just, um, it's amazing when you look at history as a profile to actually look at the evidence instead of just the, the gossip, what that tell us tells us. So that's my favorite one, the, uh, the murder of Cleopatra. How to save your daughter's life. Hey, you want to get a daughter or a woman in your life or hey, read that book. For God's sakes, give it to her. Um, what else have I written? Oh, how to, uh, only the truth if you just want a great mystery story. And I'm working on a bunch of mystery stories, by the way. I just have to try to get them in among everything else I'm doing. But I do have them. Um, I have a couple other fun, fun things. I might have missed one that I actually did. <laughs> Sometimes you can't remember stuff, you know. Hey, you know, it's funny. You know, when I couldn't remember talking to Larry, I'm like, I had no recollection of this conversation. And recently somebody said, Pat, you need to go to the doctor. You have short-term memory loss. I'm like, no, no, I have totally long-term memory loss. I mean, I can't remember my childhood hardly at all. 
And I call my sister up and she can't remember it either. So it's, it's a family trait. And so we're like sitting around going, maybe. <laughs> and then we, we laugh about it because we just make up crap. <laughs> None of us can remember. <laughs> but um, so at the moment, I do not believe I have a memory loss. I just sometimes am overwhelmed with stuff. And But that was so freaky because I could not find the profile of this case. And I'm like, what the heck? And I looked everywhere. I looked on eight hard drives. Eight hard drives, every piece. And I said, I had the bloody file. <laughs> the profile wasn't in it. I don't know. I'm just so thrilled that Larry apparently got it from the police. I don't know. So I could actually see what I wrote. I was excited. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, I'm going to get How to Save Your Daughter's Life for myself, though, not my daughter. It, it, it's applicable, applicable to all women. Um and I would really like to have written one, How to Save Your Son's Life, but, you know, um, I, I lost money on that first one. <laughs> no, I never got around to the second one. But, um, you know, especially girls. Um, I look at my granddaughter. And I, I, I want to read every chapter of my book to my granddaughter as she's eight. And I do tell her stuff all the time. I'm like, what are the mistakes that teenagers make? And she goes, drugs, alcohol, boys, driving too fast. <laughs> she's got the whole list, you know because I see her as this happy, innocent girl. And I just, the thought of her just doing stupid shit is what I call it. And she, she, she kind of knows that terminology, stupid shit. Um, uh, I the thought of her, this girl, child who loves art and rides horses and, and the caring, beautiful girl, the thought that she in five years might just decide to do stupid shit just breaks my heart. You know, luckily, I don't think around her people are doing stupid shit. So a lot of saving a daughter's life is around the adults that do stupid shit and, and don't save their children from stupid shit that they do. That's, hopefully this will get me demonetized. Because <laughs> the last I, I was doing my, my last show was my hangout and uh, I said the word fart and they put they, they cut my demonet my monetization. They put the yellow like yellow uh, uh, um the, the the yellow dollar sign, which means that the green dollar sign means you're monetized. Yellow do, dollar sign means we're holding it because we question that this is something is acceptable. And then you have to ask for a human review. I'm like, because I say the word fart, man, really? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> fart, 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 leave me. Okay. It's just like, really? That was it? Uh, so anyway, maybe I'll get demonetized again. But anyway. They, they actually gave my, they actually, they actually did a human review and they gave me my green, green dollar sign. <laughs> and you know, when you're doing an educational channel, these things are important. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, yeah. The info is re relevant to boys also. It is, but there's so many things I would like to tell about boys. Boys get involved in lots of different kinds of things because of the macho thing going on. They hook up with girls that'll play them. Uh, their, 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 their desire to like take certain drugs in order to prove themselves hey, I'm really cool is a problem. Uh, of course, uh, uh, enticement into gangs and, and into web into use of, of hope of weapons because it makes them feel like men. That's very, very important. Uh, driving fast cars. So yeah, I have a whole different, I have a whole different set of things I would have written in how to save your son's life. And I have two sons and thank God. They're now near 40 years old and have not. Did they completely miss all of those things? No, but enough of them so that they're surviving it at, at, at their age and um, and never, never been in trouble with the law and the good human beings. But no, I wish I had written a book for them. I really do. Um, Lisa says, how to save your sons. I tell him not to get involved with women who don't heed the info on how to save your daughter's life. <laughs> so incredibly true lisa absolutely you know the thing is when when, when you hook up with somebody who, who allows bad behavior or or, or or is careless that also comes on to you and so you know i i often tell my sons that i'm like hey don't hook up with the, the girl's got two two kids from two different men do not hook up hook up with her you know because she got problems uh don't go with her uh, yeah because her problems would become your problems. And if she had bad, if she had a lot of bad judgment, 
with those in her past, she's going to have bad judgment with you. So yeah, you're right about that. So <laughs> and Danny says, that's why my grandkids live with me. Very good. Yeah. Uh, that, that's it. Oh my God. You've read all my books except Cleo. Read Cleo. Read Cleopatra. That's I, my heart is with Cleopatra. It really is. I mean, <sighs> yes. Um, well, uh, Michaela says, oh, trained him well. Yes. Hopefully we train all our children well. Um, uh, you know, I even look back at, at, at Rhonda and I think to myself, you know, parents did everything to raise a, a, a very healthy, happy child. And yet something happened in that last bit of her life that put her in danger. They, they, even Judy says, I wish I had talked to her more about this. I wish I had talked to her more about that. You know, but as parents, we, we always think we miss something. And the problem is we can't catch everything. And we, why would we even suspect some of the things that happen? So Judy and Bobby, I think you were good parents. I do. Uh, I think you were good parents. And you said that, you know, um, Rhonda always wanted to be a good daughter. She wanted to be a good person. And I believe she broke up. I believe. Now, people say that Greg broke up with her. There's no way in God's earth. Rhonda broke up with Greg. She broke up with Greg because she realized he was not quite the person she wanted to be with. That something was kind of off with him. It's just incredibly sad that um, the understanding of breakups and people who have personality disorders, and I would believe anybody if I'm not saying Greg committed the crime, I can't go there. But if Greg did commit the crime, then he would have a personality disorder, which some of my concern is that during the, those, those things he sent to her about, uh, you know, have a shotgun. I do this. I do that. I believe he was highly possessive. And, and because of that, I believe he did have a personality disorder and, the problem with personality disorders, you never know where they end up, you know, how they play out. And how do you know when they're teenagers? I mean, I I, I think back and I think to myself, <laughs> a lot of things we just don't know. As parents, we do not know. Um, simple example. If you're still here at this day on this show. Um, my, one of my sisters had a fiance once and they hooked up in high school and then he went away to college. But before he went to college, that guy sat down on a sofa next to me. Remember I talked about Hansy? He got Hansy. He got that Hansy. And I remember I was maybe 15, 16, 15 or 16. And I remember being in total shock when I felt his hand go around my body. And he, I'm like, this is my sister's fiance. And I was freaked. I didn't know what to do. I thought, should I tell her? Would she believe me? Well, I tell, should I tell my parents? And he only touched me for a minute and then he took his hand away, but he did do it. And I was totally freaked. Um, I didn't know what to do. And he went off to college. And one day, right before Christmas, I think it was, my, my sister came home. By the way, this is not the sis I usually talk about. This is my other sister. And she came home, and she was crying and hysterical. And my parents are like, what's wrong? And she said, I broke up with my fiancé. They were engaged. She had a wing and everything. I broke up with my fiancé. Why? And she said, because he got into drugs. I don't know. Drugs, I'm thinking that time at weed, you know. But she wasn't into that crap. So she was like completely, completely blown away by this whole thing. And she said, I broke up with them. And my reaction was, I ran out of the room. I ran down to my bedroom. I shut the door and I said, yes, yes, yes. I was so excited. I was thrilled beyond belief because she had broken up with a guy and he was a creep. But she never knew that. Um, because I never told her and I never told my parents. Thank God she broke up with them. 
you know. Um, and she went on with her life and, and, you know, married somebody else who was stable and she had a child and they, you know, they married for many years. But I never told my parents. My parents had no clue. He looked like a nice boy. It seemed like a nice relationship. They were engaged to be married. So glad he screwed up and she dumped him. So glad. But you see, parents, you can't you can't always see everything. You can't. It's just a, it's an unfortunate thing in life, and that's what's frightening is that we don't always see things. So when I, when I talk to Judy and Barbara, I'm like, you couldn't have known. I don't think you would have known that Greg had those little issues. Not that that I mean, you eventually realize that. Greg had some issues and that his daddy had definite issues, but, and, and, you know, you, you, you struggled with that thinking, my God, I, I wish I could have protected my daughter, but how would you have known that was affecting your daughter in the way it would? I mean, there's no way. I mean, it, that was like totally out of the blue that this incredible thing happened. So, uh, I, I, in this particular case, I don't think Bobby and, and Judy had any, any reason to feel like they failed their daughter. I think that they were always there for her and still are and still are. So, um, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I think Pat needs a new podcast, Life life Lessons. Hey, you know, I might have to do that one of these days. Uh, dear Pat instead of Dear Abby. Yeah, I might have to do that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't, I, no, it wasn't that I didn't want to hurt my sister. I didn't think she would believe me. To this day, I don't think she would have believed me. Because when you say, go to your sister, you say, hey, you know, you know your fiance felt me up. I mean, would you believe it? If that was the guy you were in love with, would you believe it? See, this is where the trouble comes into. I mean, would you believe it? My answer is probably not. And she'd probably hate me, thinking, oh, you're just making up crap about my boyfriend and my fiance. You know, she probably... Do I think I did the right thing? Not necessarily, but I just don't think she would have believed me. I still don't think she would have believed me. I'm just glad the hell they broke up. Um, <laughs> um, I wish Rhonda's dad would have pressed her a little about what she wanted to tell him. Oh, there is, yeah, there is in the uh, there is a point where Rhonda's dad says that she said she had something she wanted to tell him, something that was bothering her, and and she didn't tell him. And he said, "I should have, I should have." trust her more for that. I should have found out. You know. Uh, yeah, I don't know that she would ever tell him anyway. I mean, that's why she didn't tell him. I, I don't know how much he could have pressured her. I think he just feels guilty that he couldn't have somehow gotten it out of her. But who knows what it was? Um, did she, was it really something that affect, was it something that had anything to do with her death or is it just something? You know, and that, that that's another whole point. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, what would you say there? Um, <laughs> uh, wait a minute. I saw something funny here. It just made me laugh. Um, I can't find it now. Ah, but uh, yeah, uh, Sky, Sky, Sky Ricky says, I don't think her father could have stopped him if that he, he was that violent. He couldn't have. Um, some things happen because we, we don't know. We just don't know. I mean, and even if you have questions, you know, you're concerned, how do you stop everything in life? You, can, you can't. You can't stop somebody from doing horrific things sometimes. I mean, sometimes you just can't. I mean, that's why I tell parents, you know, Unless you, if you knowingly brought a felon into your house, it's like, oh, you know, I was conversing with this guy in prison. He was a two-time killer, but I thought I'd bring him home and hang out with my teenage daughter, even though he was a suspected rapist too. Okay, I'm going to blame you because that's un that's unacceptable. But the rest of things in life, some of them just you can't predict. You can think maybe this could happen. Maybe it never happens. It's, 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 a, it's very, very tricky. Um, it's very tricky. Um, let's say, uh, Leslie says my roommate's boyfriend in college is the same. And I told her and her friend, and they said, why would you make that up? 
Leslie, are you looking for attention? I was so pissed. I still get angry. Oh, you see. Yeah. I mean, this is the problem. Uh, are you looking for attention? And the problem is some girls are, and they do lie. So I, I, I think I was too young to realize girls did that. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize people made up crap like that, like, you know, to get attention. But I just, I, I didn't know. I just believe she wouldn't believe me. I don't think she would have believed me. I really honestly do not think so. He was a church. He was a church going boy. I think after the fact that he, and she had, well, after she dumped him, I never did actually tell her. Maybe, I can't remember if I told her like 30 years later or not. I can't remember whether I actually said anything. But I believe maybe after that, she would, I, if I told her, she'd go, oh my God, thank God I dumped him. Uh, but prior to that, I think she had no clue. I mean, she had no clue. Why would she think this boy she loved would do something like that? And that, that's where that's where you have the problem. Uh, you know, then it becomes a he said, she said, and why are you saying this? Um, it, it's really tough. It's extremely difficult. Um, so, yeah, um, tough, really tough stuff. Um, <laughs> Michaela is correct. You never get between a friend and a boyfriend. It never ends well. Oh, my God, is that ever true? That is so true. Because at the time, love the love people feel so overwhelms them. They can't possibly believe that what you're saying is true. So that's true. It never ends well. You're absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Very princess. You actually looked at this case before the show. I haven't been able to see you. So do, what do you think? Have you got a comment? So I know you, I know you analyze this a wee bit. So I'm curious if you have a comment on it um, before I, before I close out the show, because we are running really late. Um, my God, we're like three hours in here. <laughs> Sandra says, looking back, I cannot believe the crap I did and I survived. <sighs> you know, I think a lot of us fear as parents and as grandparents, when we look at our children, our grandchildren, we're like, oh my God, don't do what I did. Because you do know that may have been the roll of the dice that you survived and you don't want to think of your grandchild or, or, or child throwing those same dice and maybe getting snake eyes. I mean, that's frightening as hell because I, I, you know, I remember things that I, I, I'm like, what the heck? How come I, how come I'm still here? You know, I, I, you know, it's funny. I think the number one memory I have of that for some reason, I was in Hollywood. I was doing, I was out there modeling. I went out on a date. I don't remember. I don't remember much about this, but I remember. So I was in some dude's basement. And the guy was like showing us his like handgun collection. <laughs> he was not a decent dude. And I remember thinking, "How do I get the hell out of here?" I remember thinking, "Oh my god, why am I here with these people?" And I still don't know the answer to that. And I don't have an answer to that. But I remember thinking it was creepy. So. It was like, I remember just being in this place in the, in the, and, and downstairs, I was like 19, and this guy showing us this gun collection and thinking, this isn't good. <laughs> and the thought of my child and my grandchild, my, my child is in law enforcement, my three kids, but my female child is in law enforcement. So I don't worry about her too much. She's pretty tough. But my grandchild is eight. I'm thinking, oh, my God, don't do what I did. <laughs> You know, you know, don't be stupid. Don't be stupid, man. <laughs> I'm lucky I got out of that basement. You know, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you know, so, um, very princess. I, I'm still, uh, that's very sweet. They're exemplary. I hope they find peace. I do too. I don't think you ever find peace. It's just my belief. I don't. Um, even with even when there's proper justice, I don't think you find peace. I mean, how do you? I mean, you put everything into this child that you love and adore, and some piece of crap takes her out or him out. Uh, uh, you know, people. I'm going to end my uh, end my home. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to end this show because we're late. Just with, oh, just my whole 100% feeling on this. People ask me, what is the thing I fear most in life? 
And my fear has always been the knock on the door. The knock on the door, when you open it up, there's two police officers there. And you know, it's not going to be good. Now, as I said, my daughter's in law enforcement. I feared that for years. I still fear it. She's closing in on the end of her career. 18 years, 18 years, two years left to retirement. I still fear. I'll get the knock. I'll open the door. And there'll be two people standing there, two police officers. And I know what that means. Something's not, it's not going to be good. And even with my, if any of my child wasn't in law enforcement, I have two other sons, I have two sons as well who are not in law enforcement. And I'm a granddaughter. And I have my son-in-law and other people I love. Open the door and there's two police officers there. And they say, we have something we have to tell you. We're very sorry to bring you this news and whatever it is they tell me. That's my biggest fear in life. I don't, I don't fear death. I don't fear cancer. I don't fear not being successful. I don't fear not making money. I fear two police officers shut the door. And so for every victim, every family of a victim of homicide, I, I get that. I've never been there and I don't want to be there. I don't. Yes, I know. I've worked enough cases to know I don't want to be in your shoes. I don't. So Judy and Bobby, you've been in those shoes for 40 years. And I hope like hell did you ever get an answer or any justice, and I fear the chances are slim, but I'm doing this show partly because it's just interesting to me, just to be realistic, um, after finding out this, this case was still out there four years later. I don't think I can do much to help you. I wish I could. I wish the new sheriff in town would do something. I hope the DNA could prove something. I hope there's a... Uh, confession not coming from Charles that just ex exonerates whomever he want the police want to exonerate or 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 include so they can just shut the case down I don't want lies I don't want falsities I just would like truth for you and some kind of um, conclusion but I can say this you're good parents I've never seen anything that you could have done that was more loving towards your daughter before or after her death. So anyway, that's it. So anyway, thank you for being here. Uh, it was a very interesting show for me to do because, you know, this was a, a lot of you have asked me if I could do a case, a show on cases. And I have done a, the shows I've done on cases so far, Darlene Crashaw and Andres and Cotta, um, and this is my third, I think this is my third case I've done about cases I've done. Uh, and usually I don't do them because they're still on, on you know, cases that have uh, not been um, adjudicated in any way. And I feel like I can't go forward and, and, and speak on the case. Um, but this one's already out there in the public. So I guess I can, I feel like I can do that without uh, be, being too concerned. Um, but yeah, working on these kind of cases and and and, and the frustration with the, the lack of closure for me is hard, but the, for the parents, I can't even imagine how many times harder it is for them. So anyway, that's it. Anyway, I'm going to take off now. Um, <laughs> um, thank you for all being here. Thank you for coming back for the second round. This one was not glitchy as far as I can see. So thank God I redid the, the whole show because otherwise it would have been a disaster. So anyway. Thank you so much for being here, all of you in, in the chat room. And um, yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll, maybe maybe the Hinsons will, I'll be surprised that Hinsons will get some kind of closure. Maybe. I hope so. You know, I always like to be wrong about that. 